What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and this week, I know you are all going to be just as excited as I am to have back on the show, ritual abuse, human trafficking, and mind control survivor, mother, entrepreneur, tattoo cover-up extraordinaire, artist, gallery, and tattoo shop owner, upcoming podcast host of her own YouTube channel and walking miracle, Carrie Olahe. Carrie was born into a multi-generational incest-based family from a young age and was sold into government and military sanctioned mind control programs with the goal of making her a child assassin, sex slave, and ritual butcher, just to name a few of her jobs. Her abuse was perpetuated initially by her father, who then passed her on to other handlers who furthered her programming, trafficking, and abuse. If you missed her incredible testimony, it is a must watch. Her story had a tremendous impact on me, and I was so thrilled to see how many of you commented in length how her story impacted you personally. We prefaced Carrie's last interview with a trigger warning because one of the things she did, which we haven't done on the show very much, was going into graphic detail about specific rituals she was used in, along with showing artwork she created to further explain the rituals. This was an extremely impactful way to explain something most of us listening cannot even begin to imagine or comprehend exists. We received so many amazing comments on that video on how many of you were able to understand on a deeper level programming and, um, sorry, I just lost my thought. Hold on, I have to pause this. <laughs> my screen is like blacked out, hold on. Heavenly Father, today we put on the full armor to protect us against attack. We put on the belt of truth to protect against lies and deception. We put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts from the temptations. We put the gospel of peace on our feet to walk in your light, peace and freedom with the Holy Spirit. We rebuke anxious thoughts. We take up your shield of faith for protection to block and destroy all the darts and threats thrown at us by the enemy. We put on the helmet of salvation to cover our minds and thoughts, reminding us that we are children of a mighty king. We are forgiven, set free, saved by the blood of Jesus. We take up the sword of the spirit, your living word, that has the power to demolish strongholds and is sharper than any double-edged sword. We come to you, Lord, in prayer daily. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and this week I know you are all going to be just as excited as I am to have back on the show ritual abuse, human trafficking, and mind control survivor, mother, entrepreneur, tattoo cover-up extraordinaire, artist gallery and ta tattoo shop owner, upcoming podcast host of her own YouTube channel, and walking miracle, Carrie Olahe. Carrie was born into a multi-generational incest-based family and from a young age was sold into government and military sanctioned mind control programs with the goal of making her a child assassin, sex slave, and ritual butcher, just to name a few of her jobs. Her abuse was perpetuated initially by her father, who then passed her on to other owners and handlers who furthered her programming, trafficking, and ritual abuse. If you missed her incredible testimony, it is a must watch. Her story had a tremendous impact on me, and I was so thrilled to see so many of you commenting in length how her story impacted you personally. We preface Carrie's last interview with a trigger warning because one of the things that we did, which we haven't done on the show much, was go into graphic detail about specific rituals she was used in, along with artwork she created for visuals to further explain the rituals. This was an extremely impactful way to, in, to explain something most of us listening cannot even begin to imagine or comprehend. We received so many comments on how many people were able to understand on a deeper level programming and ritual abuse and human trafficking. I'm gonna also preface this episode with a trigger warning as well, because this time around, Carrie will be doing an even deeper dive into programming, rituals, core splitting, dissociation, and so much more. Our hope is that this information furthers your deeper understanding on these topics, whether you are a survivor or an advocate. It means so much to me to see your support on this podcast, and I just want to say a quick thank you to everyone listening for uplifting, supporting, praying, and validating each guest who has the courage to get on this podcast to share their testimony. It just goes to show everyone has a story. Now on her healing journey, Carrie said it best when she stated the following, quote, I feel like they've honed a sharp weapon and now it's pointed at them, unquote. 
a testament not only to how far she's come in her healing, but also to how powerful it is for a trauma survivor to take back their power and realize that the God-given gifts they were given, that their abusers tried to exploit, can be taken back and used in a very powerful way to change the world around them. Another quote of Carrie's, if I saw my abuser on the street, it's him that would be scared of me. Wow. If you guys missed her incredible testimony, I'm going to link it below. Please go watch it. It was so powerful. Before I finish introducing our guest, I wanted to give a quick reminder that if you're a survivor, a whistleblower who wants to share your story on the podcast, or who wants to share any information privately with me, you can now email me at imaginabetterworld2020 at gmail.com. Please send me a brief intro of who you are and how I can support you. And all of my social media and donation links are also in the show notes. I'll have that all linked below for you guys. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming this week's guest of honor, Voice for the Voiceless, Fierce Mama Bear, Walking Miracle, Anti-Child Abuse Advocate, Creative and Artist, Overcomer and Survivor, the one, the only, Carrie Olahe. Carrie, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you so much, Emma. I um, couldn't believe I was here the first time. I really can't believe I'm here the second time. (laughs) So... (laughs) <laughs> thank you. You know, thank you again for having this platform. You know, it was huge for me and, uh, you know, my healing just because it is very hard to find this kind of content, especially directly from survivors um, anywhere, you know, except for like like a few um, who have like spoken out and written books. So being able to see like the complete like weight of like all of our voices is something to me that has been incredibly healing and incredibly hopeful too, that like, we're going to create some sort of awareness. And that's like the first step to solving this problem, you know, of people that are, you know, haven't had the chance to heal um, like me, even though I'm like, I am very honest with people that I am still on my healing path, you know? (laughs) So I, as much as I am kind of love, coming on to like really like vocalize my experience and the experience of victims that haven't had a voice of the things that happened to them. Um, It really, when it comes down to it, like I just want people to understand that like, I'm not an expert. (laughs) I'm, I'm like, I'm not like, I'm gonna, I am planning on giving some tips for sure on what helped me to heal, you know, in my experience and my views on what I experienced when it came to the trafficking and the rituals and stuff. But that's one thing I just want to let people know is like not to find, um, not to see me as the only source of information, (laughs) you know, that you have a lot of, you know, it's just because there's been a few people that did in comments, like you said, you know, this is the first time that they had that the other than this all the support from the survivors those were the ones that stuck out to me like and really like hit my heart you know so much was just finding out you know that there was a couple people that said that they hadn't believed in the existence of I don't know they didn't say specifically like ritual abuse child pornography snuff pornography um mind control you know uh um I was gonna say like the like you know traumatization of kids to create like essentially mind controlled slaves like all that stuff that was all part of um my experience growing up so that to me is a huge part of like why it's so hard for survivors to come out it's you really believe that there's going to be this attitude of disbelief and your abusers tell you constantly that you're going to be disbelieved so (laughs) it's and you know from a very young age when you know you you're going to believe them a hundred percent so you know, to to really like to come out and see so much support for me was incredibly healing. It's what I experienced, you know, before when I first came out about the incest and I had trusted, you know, in God and um, my higher power just, you know, yeah, I trusted in God that this, that that would be the case, you know, this time as well. And that really, even if it wasn't that I just had to do it anyway, because it's the right thing, it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, so the comments, you know, that did say, you know, people had believed this is a real thing for the first time really was some of the things that was very motivating to me, because it's something, like I said, it's not just awareness for people who haven't gone through this. It's also awareness of this in like the public or the survivor community, 
if especially if you're like you know earlier on in healing having this knowledge that there's like an atmosphere of understanding and not that you're immediately going to get called crazy you know for having really extreme experiences that are different from everyone else's you know that to me is like what makes it feel like we're we're you know when I look at a decade ago to now, like we're making some serious headway, you know, in being able to not just heal as survivors, but to try and heal like society as a whole, you know, and actually, you know, like I said, I constantly come back to the fact, you know, that, and that was a huge motivating factor for me that, that there are kids still in the situation that I was in, you know, in the situations I'm going to, you know, go over more today um that are still there right now like you know it could be your kid it could be your son or daughter basically it could be you know it could be anyone really and to know that you know they're not just going to be there for for uh you know a week or something you know it's not like it's not like a two or three or five year or jail sentence you know it's like this is going to be like 18 years of their life unless they run away sooner <laughs> you know like or, you know, or maybe longer, you know, if, if you have the experience that me that, you know, that uh, handlers continued to essentially uh, pick me up, access me, you know, in my training and stuff and continue to abuse me even past, you know, the time that I was like a consenting adult, you know, but at that time, it really is, they're still calling up, you know, a a part of your mind to take over that is essentially still a child, you know, it's still just like a traumatized child and it's still just as easy to manipulate, you know? So, um, you know, the memories that I have that are post 18 are the most difficult for sure. Like not necessarily for any other fact that it's like the hardest for me to like forgive myself for understanding, you know, how even knowing all the things that go into programming a kid to be, you know, what they made me, you know, as a child, and then later on as an adult, you know, it's still very hard to still even like wrap my head around, you know, because it is, it's like, it's the worst, it's the worst shit you can imagine, you know, and that is still some of the questions that we will address on, you know, the later Q&A that we'll do about like the questions that people submitted to you that I would love to elaborate on and everything that, you know, that's, that's still one of the questions, you know, is, is snuff porn real? And that's one thing I have to say is like a definitive, yes, it is. Um, you know, some people, you know, in mind control situations, you know, where you're really gonna have to traumatize a child like very thoroughly, like there is, and, and there's a lot of use of drugs and stuff, there is circumstances where they're gonna simulate stuff, you know, like they're gonna simulate killing they're going to simulate injury they're going to simulate a lot of different things that isn't real you know usually in my experience if that's the case it's like it's intentionally part of like the manipulation you know because then like that person suddenly they're gonna be alive again or something like that you know so it's it's there to essentially manipulate your perception of reality and question it as a kid um but um or in my experience just from i heard secondhand you know of um cults and stuff like that that don't have the same level of power you know to where they would be able to get away with like you know accessing multiple children you know or babies or animals for sacrifice and then you know being able to then dispose of the bodies like that's like a whole chain you know big old chain of events essentially you know that that has to take place but you know you using drugs, you can definitely create simulation that of, of things. Um, so that people have, or so that kids especially, you know, have the experience, you know, LSD plus all the, uh, you know, all the props, basically, you could create a, you know, definitely the experience where a kid would question, did I, you know, did I hurt someone? Did I kill something? Did I not for sure? So, um, but that's not really what we're going to be talking about much today. So, um, that's, you know, that's, that's for me, um, in my experience, you know, that, that is still going to be a certain level of trauma that's going to have like a profound effect on a kid. So I'm really not, um, minimizing that either, you know, like really like 
you know, even just telling kids about horrible things and letting their own imaginations do the work, you know, if like you're someone can really do the trick a lot of times. But um, when you have like circumstances like this, which is essentially you're trying to intentionally create uh, not just a kid that's going to be abused by their own family, but it is going to be abused by multiple people, maybe used to blackmail people or then later on, like used in like more violent things. Um, what you really need to happen is like, is you need the real thing, basically, like, it has to be like, it has to be really founded on, um, like the most extreme forms of like, of child abuse ever, you know, and that's one gap that I'm hoping that like my testimony will fill, you know, that to be honest, I'm not saying it's just me, there's plenty of survivors that have like, that have um, gone over, basically, the um, extremes of child abuse that that occur um but it still feels like even with all those testimonies that's still the gap that's in you know in the community of people that are willing to look about this look at this stuff and learn about it and everything it still feels like that's where there's like this disconnect is that there's still this like idea of dissociation and you know manchurian candidate stuff and beta sex can stuff it all has this very like hollywood kind of appeal uh, like facade to it basically that makes it seem like you know like that still I hear people say you know it's something that you know it could just you know they, they could just pick up an adult and do it too and it's like yeah even if that's the case like where someone had no mind control experience you know and was picked up as an adult and went through really extreme experience experienced Stockholm syndrome and is now like you know kind of has like a different part of themselves that thinks completely differently about the world and is going to behave that way like the person's ability to do that is going to be based off of how much they were abused as a child anyway you know like that's and whether or not you know it was the organization doing the traumatization early on or just like the kids early life experiences you know like that's going to be the degree to which someone you know can get essentially you know turned into into a slave so this still you know to me this like idea like I, I mentioned before with like split where it's like they don't like you know the idea that that there's going to be really drastic changes you know and that you know in my experience that I mean, we didn't go even a little bit into like the amount of trauma that would have to be experienced for someone to have like that like level of presenting like DID which is like insanely rare you know when I want to explain to people what the difference is especially for a DDNOS system where the intention is that we're going to be a little less detectable, both by our own system, but then also by outsiders, you know, um, the, you know, experience of, of a switch, or like, if people wanted to see like a switch, like you could essentially look at like, like our bathroom break mark in, uh, in the first testimony, basically. So, um, most people will see that it was probably a little bit easier to listen to the second half, <laughs> the second half of the interview, you know, than the first half. Mannerisms are a little bit different, but the thing is, they're not going to be drastically different to most people to where if I hadn't pointed out right now, like most people wouldn't notice. They'd just be like, oh, like you were a little more nervous in the first one, you know, or the first half, you know, using, um, you know, my filler words, like, you know, or like a lot more, <laughs> basically giggling a lot more. But a lot of that stuff, you know, it's like, there's like a very specific part that was like created to interface with the public by my, you know, by my abusers, essentially. And that's, you know, it's going to be very dissociated from any negative emotions. It's everything is going to be a joke. Um, typically very a little bit younger presenting and a little bit ditzier so there's gonna be lots of likes and you knows <laughs> and all that stuff but like I said I'm still gonna have a little bit of that a little bit of that now because I'm I'm on a podcast talking but it's it's there's a difference in the more grounded version of of me <laughs> versus a more dissociated version of me basically and and that's the thing like my easiest way to describe it to people is that you know we I kind of described in the first one that we have the different um you know compartments that are sectioned off but um for especially for like DDNOS you know the experience a lot of times for me I describe it as a car you have like someone who's in the driver's seat of the car as in in control of like 
the body and mouth basically. Um, and then you also are going to have some in the passenger seat and then maybe like two or three or four kids in the back seat and everything's everyone's, you know, it's not like the driver is like an isolated, like, um, entity basically but usually you are pulling like a trailer I would say of like all the other parts that are in the subconscious that haven't been triggered for a while you know <laughs> that that are a lot more like like not not accessed unless something in your reality kind of triggers it but essentially that's a lot of times you know people's experiences a certain like blending of parts where you'll have like a part that's in the driver's seat and in my experience um you know first half of the interview it really sucks when that's the case because um it feels it feels very much like you're on a roller coaster ride that you don't quite have like the ability to control essentially so that's why that's part of why it took some time to get grounded essentially after um after like the halfway mark ish essentially because it was something that I was aware was happening um and needed to kind of like put the put the brakes on but essentially you know that like that kind of subtle shift that you might have seen in my behavior, you know, that's like the shift of like one part taking the driver's seat versus versus another, you know, usually the other part that was in the driver's seat will now be in the passenger seat. So you'll still have input like, you know, like everyone loves a backseat driver, you know, but <laughs> but it's that's typically like a lot of times how it works. And for DDNOS, the reason they, they do it this way is that, um, you essentially want to minimize like full switches unless like it's triggered by daily events, unless it's like a very, it's triggered by your handler. Essentially they don't want, if you, if you're a kid that has all these sexual skills or all these violent skills or all this different stuff, you don't want that just like coming out in daily life. And there were plenty of ways that it did when I was a child, like come out, like, you know, little things that it was just very weird to people, you know, that I was so sexual or so, you know, like, um, you know, uh, phobic of different things or, you know, very dissociative, you know, which was like, they always said I was, you know, in la la land, basically, you know, so I was always just kind of like, you know, daydreaming and stuff. So, but that's how it, you know, like I said, that's how it, how it presents. It's not something like big, like I don't, you know, change your clothes. And then all of a sudden, you know, like obviously different parts that feel more comfortable in different clothes, like items of clothing, but generally we're going to dress for like the part that's going to be you know, interacting most of the day, because that's how they're going to be comfortable, you know, so that's, that's really just kind of like the, um, I guess, kind of how I wanted to go over, just kind of explaining, you know, the experience, just the experience of dissociation, you know, for myself, and just to help people like to kind of see, you know, how, you know, even if they're helping survivors in their own lives, you know, that it's, you know, you're, you shouldn't necessarily be expecting him to talk in baby voice, you know, or something like that, like that can definitely happen. But in general, you should pretty much assume that like, all of the parts are always li <laughs> like always around and like always listening and just be talking kind of like, respectfully. And that goes for like us too, as survivors, you know, sometimes the front person can have like, you know, not the best attitude for for parts that we're getting to know, you know, so and that's like, that's like normal to be like that sometimes with new people you're getting used to if you're on the outside world that's very much how it feels on the inside world too you know sometimes so yeah um but uh that was um I mean a long like a really a long-winded way of just being like I am like insanely grateful that it seemed like me sharing like did exactly what I had hoped you know that it did uh it seemed to help um clarify some things for people as far as like, I don't even know, just the, to me, it's like, you know, the landscape of like the organ, the organized version of child abuse and, you know, um, mind control and pornography, you know, and then also giving some context to things that might be like weird to people, like the new world order type stuff or something, you know? Um, Cause like I said, I just, I, I, I don't always chalk up a lot of reality to those things. A lot of times, like when it comes to both the rituals and when it comes to new world order stuff or anything, I like recognize that these are kind of the belief systems that are naturally going to come out of psychopathy basically. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, um, the only event, you know, that I had wanted to go into that I hadn't gotten to go into before, well, had chosen not to basically, um, because it's still an event that I am uh, processing myself. Um, <laughs> I 
So it's sometimes hard to talk about. Um, but I decided that it's something I wanted to talk about today, mainly because um, I think that it'll give a really, I don't know, it's it's basically the memory that I have of um, like the main uh, kind of like torture event that was created to be like the, I don't know, essentially like the the memories that all of the other parts would then be based off of. So most of my later programming events that I had all talked about on my original testimony, um, a lot of them would use things that would reference uh, events that had happened um, in this initial like programming uh, session. So I would say, you know, with something like this, it's like, there's, you know, there's definitely like a main part that deals with it, but there's also multiple parts. And that's very intentional from them is that they're a lot of times with this stuff, they're going to create um, a different part around each trauma specifically so that, you know, then you could um, re-trigger that part with the same trauma, you know, and essentially, you know, kind of keep, keep working with, with it essentially with, as far as training and um, I was going to say, or having it just, you know, come out to do whatever the job was that the, that the handler was interested in. Um, so I'm going to grab a drink of water. Do you have any, um, any questions or input or anything before I like keep rambling on? <laughs> I just wanted to say, I can understand how people got a lot out of what you said, because you really do have a gift for explaining things that are really hard in a very simple way, just like that car analogy that you use. That even for me, like furthered my understanding of that because I'd never heard it worded that way. So it's another tool that I can add to say, oh, that makes sense to me. Like I've sat in all those seats in a car and I know like how I feel in relation. Like when you're the driver, you feel a certain way when you're sitting passenger, like you almost have certain roles, you know, like you're going to, you, you're going to tune the radio or turn the, you know, turn the volume up, whatever it is. Um, and then sitting in the back, you know, so I just want to say that I love how you do that because I think that really helps click things in people's minds where they say, oh, that makes sense. That's that's something that I've done or that I can imagine doing where what she's explaining happened to her, I can't understand. I can't, yes. my mind can't go there, but my mind can be in a car and I can picture how those different roles feel. And so it's like a way for people to relate to something that they've never experienced. So I wanted to comment on that because I think you do that very beautifully. And I think that like that's a natural gift for you is educating on hard things and like simplifying them. Um, so and, and I, I want to thank people too. Like, oh my gosh, the outpouring of support it's was been amazing. incredible. Cause I, you know, I just delete bullies. Like I don't put up with, you know, comments unless, unless there's like a healthy dialogue going on where like, you know, you can see people improving the conversation and people can read. Oh, I don't mind a debate for sure. You know, I, yeah. a, part, a part of me definitely like has no problem, you know, having hard conversations, you know, with, with people for sure, you know, cause I think that's like needed you know so it's something that I've got like after a while I've gotten used to doing but like you're saying on a certain level sometimes things are just not productive right they're just there to bully you know and so like I don't tolerate that so there was a couple people that I did you know there, there was a couple comments that I deleted but 99.9% .9 of everybody like some people were disclosing their stories mm -hmm. like, I was so blown away with all the support you know and and I appreciate everybody who sent in questions and we will get to those like Carrie said we're going to do a little Q&A towards the end. Um, one question though, I did want to ask you, Carrie, before you get into what you were doing, because I've actually had this asked to me a bunch of times, mm -hmm. sent some resources or some interviews, but I, I have a feeling that there might be people that ask this after you were just talking about dissociation. Um, can different parts, so each of them has different role in a sense, so they have different skills. Can they also have different maybe physical attributes? Like could one part maybe be left-handed and another one's right-handed? Could one identify as like having blonde hair, you know, or like some type of a different attribute and then another one doesn't obviously, you know, are there like different ways that, or like eyesight's different with one, with one part than another part, you know, better or worse. Can things like that differentiate between parts also, or does that stay mainly consistent? So 
That's a, that's, so that's kind of a tough one. Uh, I will say that I have heard of things like that, like really drastic physiological differences, you know, that occur. But to me, that does tend to fall in the category of Hollywood for the most part. I have always just heard it in passing you know it's like it's like people have mentioned it but it's like have never said that that was their particular experience but when it comes to skills for sure so you know like so that's like you know like you learn to ride a bike you know or you learn like you know like if you were a chef you learn like a certain like chopping skills or different things like that you know like so if you were to put the knife in the hand of someone, you know, and be like chop these carrots, like the same way of a knife as the chef, you know, like their hand could be anatomically the same as the, uh, as the, uh, the chef's hand, but because there's no like knowledge, you know, there's no like mind body awareness on how to achieve the thing. There's been no practice or anything like that you know, you're not going to get, you're not going to get the same results, you know? So it, it's more in my experience, it's more like that. Like, so like there's like parts that are really great at like, maybe, you know, that were made to be like sex kit and type stuff. If you were to ask them to cook, like you're just going to get something really someone really cranky and something really burned you know <laughs> versus like I opened a restaurant that like I you know had like and I and then closed it you know within a year because I timing was wrong like I was pregnant and I was doing all these other things too so but you know I closed that with like with like five stars and stuff like that so it's like I know how to I know how to cook I know how to make a recipe and stuff but like I said it's like you know it's it's very it's very particular you know like what it's more that when one part switches in, it feels like what the body feels comfortable doing will be completely different, you know? So you could have, you know, a star athlete and then a total like, you know, artist book nerd, you know, but they're actually in the same body, you know? And it's more about how they use the body than the body physically changing, you know? So that's, I think that's like the main way that at least for me, like, you know, dealing with like the more soldier type memories and everything like that was one way that for me was very validating but also very you know just trippy basically really like freaky to be like you know like I don't know how to hurt someone you know but then when you're dealing with these flashbacks coming up and you're dealing with that part you know like that part has a lot of training that I like wasn't aware of as like the front person until I started dealing with all the, with all the flashbacks around it essentially. And then it will, and then it will, in my experience, you know, with like some integration of the memories, it will, it will bleed in, you know, to where like now it's like some of like the weapon skills have come back, you know, and like, and that's something you feel crazy and then, and then you like, you pick something up, you know, and then you're just like, okay, like, I guess I do know what I'm doing a little bit. And it freaks, you know, it freaks you out a little bit. And you're just like, okay, but that's, you know, it's, it's validating on the same level as everything else is. And, you know, it, and it, there's a lot of things that you can't explain until you have your flashbacks. And then it's like, okay, like, well, that, that makes sense now. So, so for me, like I, right now, like, you know, in this, you know, setting and everything, like knowing how to like, you know, how to fight someone with a knife, like not going to happen. But like, if someone were to run in at me, you know, trying to fuck me up, like, and the adrenaline kicks in, like, that's for sure going to happen, you know, like, like, as far as because and that has even in my experience been some of my my experience essentially like when I was in a, a dog fight basically you know and that I think I might have mentioned it last time um you know but it was a triggering event in just like in recent years you know I think it happened maybe like three four years ago um but it was uh you know a, a dog that I was essentially um my dog you know that was attacking another one of my dogs and during the you know, during the fight, you know, it really was like the internal battle, essentially, you know, I, I'm still at set, dealing with the situation, but you are typically still having like, you know, a very like insanely, regardless of how like, uh, 
traumatic, whatever is going on out here. It's like the conversation usually is very like rational, basically. So essentially, you know, my, you know, like main part of myself, essentially, who's trying to get one dog off of another dog, who's trying to find a non-lethal way to do this, because I love both of these dogs that are that are in the fight, you know, um, but the part of me that had been trained essentially to handle a knife and had been, you know, around like vicious dogs, you know, or trained to be a vicious wolf or stuff like that, you know, like when they see the same situation, they're like, this is a threat. We need to neutralize it. So it was like it, you know, it despite, you know, wrestling on the ground. And I had like, I had to get stitches, like 10 stitches across my finger. Cause like right in the very beginning, I had like, tried to pry her off. And obviously that was a bad idea. I got like, you know, my finger sliced open, you know, <laughs> but like I said, I like it, it's kind of, it kind of sucks. Like I go into like, you know, into take care of business, like robot mode, like when it, when it comes to like high um, adrenaline situations, basically. So in that, in that situation, that part of me was like, let's just go in, grab a butcher knife, and we'll just end it, you know, like just grab one of the knives from the kitchen, you know, it's like, and it was like the whole time was, I was trying to deal with the dog fight. But then I was also like, I was also dealing with this internal battle, you know, of, of a part of me that really just wanted to, you know, to essentially grab the knife and use it how we essentially had been taught to use it. You know, at that time, it was before I had had most of my ritual abuse memories come back. So it was like a time when I still had a lot of like gaps in my life. It was incredibly triggering. And it that's part of why like that whole event for me as, you know, just like a survivor, just dealing with all that stuff anyway, you know, it would, you know, it's, it's going to be traumatic. It's your dogs. If you're a dog person, you know, animal person, you know, it's like they're your babies, you know? <laughs> so, and I feel bad because the one that did the attacking, she just had a screw loose in her head. You know, we had talked to trainers and stuff like that, but she like, she came from a line of like, you know, it's, it's the genetic side of things, you know, that on a certain, for certain things, not for pit bulls in general, but for her specifically, you know, she had a line of fighting dogs, you know, and you th assume that's not going to matter, you know, but it was a consistent problem with her, like, despite everything, you know, um, and I still loved her. She was my princess, you know, <laughs> but, you know, so, so that, that's just an example, you know, of, of, you know, how, same body, you know, you're going to have completely different ways that, that you want to handle the situation and completely different like skills, you know, too, because it's like the part of me that was, that was in charge and handling this situation was trying to hold back, you know, the more like psychopathic feeling part, you know, like that, that, um, that part of me, like they don't have any understanding of each other's skills. They don't have any of each other's, each other's emotions or anything. So for me, you know, it's like a lot of people that have the experience of like persecutor parts, you know, or like the common DID or like, you know, parts that are mauled after abusers or seem like they're demonic or psychopathic or something. Um, that was part of the trauma of the event for me is just like, what is wrong with me that I was like, that I, that I was thinking about killing my own dog, you know what I mean? Like, even regardless of the situation or anything, you know, so it was like, you know, it was dealing with like the, you know, the trauma of the dog fight, but then it was also dealing, you know, as a survivor, you end up having, until you have context for like these emotions, for these parts that feel the way they do until you're able to work with them and heal them some, it's really hard because it, you like you don't have context for stuff and it just ends up feeling like it it becomes really easy to believe the things that the abusers have told you which is that you're evil that deep down you're just like them you know that basically that there's you know that you know that you're you're just a piece of shit and a killer you know and that's like and that's you know essentially what I had lived with my whole life you know and having no context for it most people see me as a very I've always been a very sweet you know hippie artist you know bookworm kind of girl you know very academically focused and stuff like that so um you know the thought my you know main self in life of ever hurting anyone or anything is like is completely foreign you know so um so long-winded answer for yeah not I don't have any specific experience of stuff like that you know most of the time like if when you're saying they'll definitely be identifying as different things though internally so and that'll have like a lot to do with what it'll feel like the physical characteristics are of the body you know so if like it's a sex part I'm going to feel a lot more confident essentially in my body 
um, versus if it's like, you know, a part that's like dealing that was there to deal with trauma or is a more like masculine or male part, you know, if that part comes out, you know, they're not going to feel super comfortable in like this little female, <laughs> this little female body, you know, and even like the sex parts when I was pregnant, like, oh my god like that was like that was hard not to have like to for to get like really contextualize for them you know like the pregnancy thing you know and like and you know a couple of the parts like were like uh like especially when it came to like the more um the more front persona um one that's usually interacting with the public you know that's the one that always had issues with like uh body dysmorphia you know and eating disorder kind of stuff and everything so like for her to see like you know to look look in the mirror and see like a pregnant body <laughs> was like was really hard you know and it was but it was also really healing because it, it was an opportunity to then work with like that part of myself you know and really recognize like you know why do we have these unrealistic expectations and like it's a different kind of beauty and everything and, and it was it was really healing that's one thing that I I really push people to to looking at the hard stuff in their life and looking at the things that they haven't wanted to work on and heal is because as it kind of feels worse until it gets better for sure. But like when it gets better, it's so much better. You have like, you know, to, for me to like be able to like walk around in a bathing suit, like the first time, like it was like maybe like three, four years into therapy. And it was like a water park. I was walking around in a bathing suit. And it was like the first time I hadn't like thought about how much my thighs were shaking or something you know and it was just like it was just like wow like this is so nice to just feel like comfortable in my own body and not like not feeling like you know like there was all these like these anxieties and dialogues going on you know and just like it was just it was just crazy you know and it wasn't something I had expected to happen you're so used to living with with stuff you know the way it is but it's you know you're when you're dealing with trauma on this level like if you're a survivor like it really is like the fish in the water situation like your whole experience of like how you craft your view of yourself the world everything has been so fucked from so early on that it like it takes a it takes a lot a long time you know like as ed mentioned before i'm seven years into trauma therapy you know it takes a while to get grounded and there's always still going to be times where like you're really not, you know, like, and you have to, you know, and that you're just going to be kind of white knuckling it until, till you're through to like the next the calm period, you know, but yeah. Wow. That was a really great answer. I appreciate you answering that. Cause I think that can be confusing for people too, you know, but in a way, even somebody who's not fragmented at all, like we have a personality that we take to work and that's, yeah. What we do for eight hours. People listen to music to get in the mood, you know, like that kind of thing, you know, like to kind of like trigger like the like to get themselves like amped up into like a certain you know, people do have the experience of like a work self, a friend self, you know, a family self, like that kind of thing. And it takes the environments or things to kind of like trigger like you to be behaving, you know, in that way. Yes, a hundred percent. Thank you. You said that better than I could. That's no, no, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, that that was perfect. Thank you for explaining that because I was trying to wrap my brain around it. But I was thinking, gosh, like I have, you know, there's there's things that I can't say or do like out at work or around certain people. But like if I'm just chilling at home and there's nobody around, like I'll be more open and more myself. And you know, yes. we all have like these different personas in a sense that we, like you said, adapt to with our environment. So I think if people can internalize that about just themselves yeah. and then try to put the context of like, maybe just not being as conscious of it, you know, or having it be a little, just a different dynamic of, you know, of switching though, of switching that, you know, it's really not that hard to think about it being uh, something that we can internalize and conceptualize, you know, like I think the way yeah. that you broke that down, it, it can help other people understand how it's possible that that can happen if they're right. like, that sounds too crazy. You know, like there's no way that our brains and our bodies can do that. Well, yeah, they can, you know, and yeah. you did a really great job breaking that down. So I appreciate it. Well, and it's like, take that and then add like a blackout drunk. Like if people have had an experience with that, you know, like that's like, that's pretty much, you know, like what you're going to have, like with dissociation is that you're, you know, there's 
also going to be like a chemical and physical thing going on in here because of like that's PTSD you know it's like it's different than a normal experience you know it's not just a normal work day or normal family day you know it's the the splitting like for it to happen it requires something that's like so traumatic basically that it really does require you know your brain to be like okay if I'm still going to be able to have you know a self that interacts with family, interacts with school, interacts with like mom and dad, you know, even though dad is nice sometimes and other times like horrible, you know, that's why it's like, you know, your brain essentially creates the blackout drunk, you know, like during, during that, you know, that moment of intense trauma to be like, oh shit, this is something that like, that you're not going to be able to like mentally like live with be able to remember like spiritually emotionally like physically you know because a lot of times we dissociate pain you know so there'll be that was one thing that I missed you know in that answer you know is definitely different parts in my experience have different pain you know so like that's a lot of times how I'll know like what parts are like triggered they have a lot of body memories you know so you'll you'll deal with a lot of survivors have things like that they consider like more fibromyalgia or different stuff like that but a lot of stuff I really think is if, especially if you're a ritual abuse memory a lot of it I think like joint pain or different stuff like that is going to be like just the body memories of being raped or being like tied up you know a lot of times like at like joints or stuff like that so in my experience like almost all my physical like like pain like health issues that I've had like have all been for the most part like like uh psychologically triggered you know by different parts essentially and a lot of that too is very intentional by the abusers to essentially like create like very like physical like really painful physical and emotional barriers to accessing those emotions you know they kind of have these like these like um like uh they're trying to build into the system kind of like these backup systems you know to where they're going to be using your own body your own brain your psychology a lot of things against you you know and they know that in a trauma memory like they'll be able you'll essentially be able to call back up a feeling of being tortured you know essentially you know and that's like and then that's like what they'll what they'll intentionally program in you to to anytime your mind starts wandering in a, you know, making a connection to something it's not supposed to, that's supposed to stay isolated in a way and in your subconscious, unless they want to have access to it, then you'll start experiencing, you know, a lot of like physical symptoms. So like sometimes, you know, people will have the experience of having a headache and then it's settling going away, you know, like as like the part switches, you know, or different pain sensations, you know, energy levels, like all that stuff, you know, is like, it can be really drastic, you know, like, like one moment to the next when like a switch happens, because like all of that is linked to to the thing. But like, yeah, so that, but so it's like, it's more about the physiological experience, I think, though, for the survivor than anything than anything that could be noticed by like, an outsider too much, you know, I mean, it's other for things like posture, mannerisms different things like that will typically you know um that will definitely change thank you so much like I said you just have such a, a a gift for explaining these hard things you know and I'm sure people that are listening are like you know just having these light bulbs come up in their heads so I appreciate you thank you well thank you I mean um that's like where, like I said, the fish in the water situation, that's why I really appreciated you taking the questions from people. It's just because I, um, you know, it's my whole life. It's really big. It has so many different facets to it and understanding where it is I could fill in some gaps for people that's actually helpful or like where I'm maybe not being as, you know, explicit because, you know, you just, it's hard to explain your own experience, you know, in general. So, um, but yeah, um, so thank you. Um, so sorry, I'm going to grab a drink of water real quick. And then um, if you want, um, we don't need them quite yet. I would rather get into the uh, event a little bit first, um, just because um, the photos might be a little bit triggering for myself as well. The main reason I want to include them, though, like with anything is that like, like, for one, it'll give some context to what journaling is <laughs> and that's the like when you're journaling and you're dealing with like the shit that like we are is like 
as like, you know, ritual abuse or like for, you know, trafficking survivors, you know, there's going to be some really horrible, disgusting things in your memories, you know, and, and the degree to which you're holding back those things in or pushing them away in your journaling typically is kind of the degree to which you're kind of preventing yourself from healing. Cause we still have this idea, this very childlike idea that like, it's still happening. We can't do anything about it. We're in an unsafe situation. Like all of that stuff, you know, is, is part of it. So that's one thing I like to say, you know, is that you just don't like, you really don't hold back into my experience. Like, that's why, like, like, these images, you know, of victims that like, I'm going to be showing like, are essentially like, you know, for me, like the worst parts of the memory, you know, are, but that really for me is like what the thing is, that's the most like healing when it comes to journaling, basically, because it's, you know, that part of you, like, that's the thing that it's like fucking lived with for like decades, <laughs> you know, and felt like, you know, like, like, it's like a part of yourself, you know, as a little kid, it felt like they could never share, would never be understood, you know, all this different stuff or that, like, for the rest of the parts that don't hold it, that it's like, why would we want to go back there? <laughs> you know, that's how it feels like in healing. But the thing I have to just keep telling people is that whether it's journaling, you know, for me, it's always, whether it's writing or painting, it's, it's always got to start with the worst parts because they're going to be intrusive until you deal with them, you know, in my experience, and you'll start dealing with a lot of like physical symptoms because of it. But also because um, like for me, that's part of the healing is essentially like, like these are three victims who never had their story told, you know, and if this is like the way that like, I, you know, can just, you know, also not just tell my story, but tell theirs and have people like really understand like how fucked up this stuff is and like how necessary it is for us to like, 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 I don't know, like create, like, I really think that I know people want names and stuff, but, you know, really until we have like a, a level of awareness in society that they're, you know, in my experience, I've tried approaching law enforcement, and different things with like, you know, not the greatest results, you know, and, and lawyers, different stuff like that. You know, I have some in my, I have some in my court, you know, but still it's like, you know, like there's not as much as you can, as you can really do. So like for me right now, like, I really am confident that like, awareness is like is you know what you're working on you know with your podcast and I really feel like in general like with people that are just advocates that are willing to just like be open with people in their lives about like you know knowing about this stuff or anything like it really is like the thing that is going to create you know some justice for like the victim and everything and then also like create like an attitude we just need an attitude shift you know an awareness and the this is like society in general, you know, because I know that, you know, as people find out about it, people are not cool with it, you know, that national security be damned, no one's okay with like, with like systematic child, like rape and torture, you know, like, so, and, and that's the thing that, that it, it really, it really is, you know, so, um, yeah. so yeah, um, but uh, yeah, unless you, unless you have anything else, I'll, I'll just kind of get into um, the kind of like a little bit of the context with that memory. Absolutely. Yes. Um, there was one more thing that I was going to say. Um, I think going off what you were saying where society kind of stops at a point, I think that's why these analogies to relate it to something that people can physically feel, see, and just kind of use their proprioception and like representational systems to, to process. I feel like there's a point even with like, you know, the words human trafficking, like that's a broad term now. People are aware of it where maybe five, 10 years ago, like nobody had really heard that term really. It's pretty mainstream now. But there's also a block even with with those words where people dissociate the fact that it's happening in their communities. They just picture, oh, well, that just happens in, you know, these third world countries that just yeah. happens. And so there is like, there's a big disconnect with people realizing like how close to home it is. And I think part of that is people are really afraid to consider that, but that's why testimonies like yours Icky. are like, do you even want it? Like, I mean, who wants to think about this kind of stuff for like, for more than like a few seconds? Like it really takes like, I think it takes like, that's why the awareness is like important because it really takes like a level of awareness, like in general for someone to finally be like, okay, I can't 
not think about this. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, I've heard about it too many times. Like, all right, I've got to like, you know, see, like, see like what's, what's up with this or something, you know, that it's, you know, and, and an attitude though, too, like of within society, you know, that you're not going to be called crazy by your friends for talking about something like this, you know, even just as like, you know, as just like an ally or something, because, you know, we're still, we're still, we're dealing, in my opinion, with like the redux of, of the satanic panic right now. And most people are referencing the satanic panic right now as if that was a thing then when, you know, when you look into all the stuff that happened, then there was, there was a lot of truth to a lot of things, you know, and a few people that had gotten falsely accused were very publicly, you know, sacrificed on the, on the altar so that they could essentially make it seem like everyone was making things up, you know, but really, you know, that's, that's how we got to this place of, you know, insurance companies like suing, suing therapists out of, treating dissociative people you know like in the satanic panic time you know and being the false memory syndrome foundation coming out as essentially a pr campaign that was created by pedophiles you know to essentially say you know anyone who was being accused of this stuff was you know being falsely accused and it was all therapists you know so and the thing that's really sad is like you know they recently had a couple that was like released after being falsely accused after 15 years in Texas or something. And it's all, it's all shit in my opinion, that's just there to kind of like re rehash that narrative, basically that anyone who thinks that ritual abuse is a thing that occult style abuse is a thing, you know, like anyone who sees that stuff as like a thing is, is crazy, you know, and just like, you know, like you'll believe anything you hear on the internet. And it's like, there's like, there's so much evidence for this stuff. You know, law enforcement has tons of evidence for this stuff. CIA leaked documents have tons of evidence for this stuff. FOIA documents have tons of, you know, but it's, it's still, you know, for decades, you know, and, but I, I am confident, you know, that, um, you know, that with, with, a bigger understanding of the problem people understand it more as what i'm hoping they understand which is just organized crime like no one has any issue understanding like shit around organized crime and it's literally this is just the same thing but it's like but the goods are like create more way more damage you know because we're talking we're not talking about drugs or guns or something like that we're talking about you know like innocence essentially so um but yeah um on that note, uh, so I guess like with this, like I'll I'll kind of give like a, a little bit of context, like a little bit of a recap, I guess, on where it falls into like the general timeline of my story. Um, if you you know hadn't watched my first testimony, I would recommend it. It's way too long, but there's a lot of stuff that I went through, and that's even you know that's a, the tiniest little like you know that's tiniest little snippet of it, you know, that I could give to give like a good view of like what um, kind of like what the different abuses I went through really entailed throughout my life um, and everything. Um, but uh, an event that I hadn't talked much about, I had mentioned was like the core splitting event. And this is something that, you know, everything's going to, you know, all of my programming kind of like references back to basically. And it's going to happen really early because of that, you know. And so for me, um, it was essentially like multiple times to have like multiple traumas combined. So um, I had mentioned before, you know, that uh, I was a military kid. Both my parents were in the military. Um, my mom is like a very sweet, but also she was very like abused and kind of like blind individual, like when I was growing up, basically. Um, my dad is um, a sociopath, you know, so he has uh, zero empathy and, but he's very good at looking very um, charming and, uh, you know, accomplished and, and all those things. And they were both in the medical field in the military. Um, so because of this, they went, several, my mom left several times um, to do training um, where my dad would be left with me essentially as like a single parent for like, you know, sometimes several months um, on end. So uh, this particular trauma for me, um, like, and that's why I call it just the, I just call it core splitting event, you know, this particular trauma, like for me was um, timed with like a bunch of different things. So essentially the first time that she left, we had just moved to Texas. Um, I had had, a, you know, some initial like uh, kind of 
my dad had always sexually abused me since I, since an infant, you know, but it wasn't more damaging things. So the first time that I had dealt with anything a little bit more invasive or damaging was at Walter Reed in, in Washington, D.C. And that was about a year or so before we moved to Texas. And I had mentioned in the last interview that Texas is where essentially like all hell broke loose, you know, for me, because it was essentially feeling like I had been, you know, um, and this is why we need the awareness, feeling like I had been kind of like plugged into an assembly line of child torture, basically, and that it's it, the whole experience as fucked up as it was for myself. It's like the whole experience to me has a whole nother layer of fucked upness to like my adult self to realize how like I was just one of so many kids that went through the same shit essentially you know and and many kids that went through worse stuff because as you'll see they you know they use some kids to make examples of them for other kids so um so for so for me you know it was in essentially initially going to um going to uh uh texas shortly after we had moved there my mom went on like her first trip basically and so it was dealing with the trauma of that first you know like mom not being around um my dad was usually on like fairly good behavior if my mom was around but as soon as she was gone you know it's like i saw a completely different side of him you know he just kind of like turned into a bachelor was very neglectful um you know like really was not didn't was not very interested in me except for you know like maybe like the facade of playing to like initiate like sexual abuse or stuff like that you know so you know he like I had mentioned before like his um like his preferred form of abuse typically was to like was to you know orally rape me while he was watching snuff films and the snuff films were typically you know people being um, like burned or like injured in different ways, you know, sometimes suffocated and stuff. So, um, so I, I did have some initial, you know, trauma, um, for sure, you know, like they're, you're, they're always interested if you're going to be used for mind control and like, like always using the kids of, of sociopaths and pedophiles and stuff, because they really want a kid that's, you know, that's split early, you know, so, um, but um, so I would consider this event more like their like what they wanted to do as like their main trauma event, essentially, to kind of like really kind of like anchor in um, uh, some like, you know, very powerful, very afraid parts, you know, of, of myself that would be easy to manipulate as, you know, the abuse continued later on. Um, so after several days of being you know, a couple of days with my dad being, you know, a different kind of version of dad, essentially, you know, and dealing with like the trauma of my mom being gone, it was being taken to um, what was essentially like a, a children's hospital, like a wing of like, it, you know, it was a wing of a hospital that was like, um, like a children's ward, you know, had lots of colorful things on like the walls and stuff, you know, like I remember being taken to kind of like a, like a room where there was like you know, toys, you know, when we could all play like as kids and stuff. It wasn't a big deal to me at the time. You know, I was like a little apprehensive, like with my dad, just kind of like leaving me there with people, but they like say a lot to reassure you, you know, it, it feels like, you know, like I, and as a military kid at that point, you know, I was so used to just, you know, going to daycares or different stuff like that. So, um, so essentially, you know, and, and the thing is when you're dealing with these memories, they're going to be dealing with like, a fragmentary nature to things to a degree. So there's going to be a little bit of skipping around, you know, where I don't necessarily know how I got from one place to another. And I think also a lot of that is intentional when you'll find what, like what this particular memory was like. So essentially for me, it was, you know, it was playing with like, with like three or four other kids um, in like a little room and everything. And it's starting to get late. And then essentially I don't remember anything other than, um, anything after that in that location but then it's essentially waking up in what would be like a like a, a black wire like dog kennel in um i and this is where it's hard to say too is like that i i have a lot of memories and locations like this which you know would be like I could say, you know, look very similar to like maybe like some like underground bunkers or like bases or storage units or something like that. But 
it's hard to say because you could also be dealing with a spot that's above ground that has the same kind of jail like quality to it you know so it's you know with me with most of my programming you know more intense programming memories you know they're all in locations that are you know very similar to like like underground or or above ground like I said I don't know storage facilities you know they're all concrete you know concrete walls ceiling um you know lots of like you know doors and sometimes like hallways that are big enough for like a little like um ATV GP type you know thing to like drive down basically um so it was essentially waking up um in uh like a black wire kennel in a a little bit larger room um that that was that looked like this it was really dimly lit you know it just had a couple hanging lamps it was um really dirty it smelled like of like of like urine and you know and like feces and stuff like that like um it was you know the whole experience for this one like from start to finish was like created to just kind of like assault you on like every level I say I kind of say you know like like your senses essentially you know so um, so it's like, you know, the place was incredibly dirty, you know, including the cage that like that I was in, you know, like nothing, nothing was clean, you know, it was, you know, like, uh, you know, waking up being very groggy, having, um, seeing like there was like, there was like six other cages in addition to, um, my own that also had kids. And some of them were the kids that I had recognized from the, um, from the, uh, upstairs, basically from the, um, what you might call it from the waiting room but you know and it was just you know being you know we're talking about like but like four-year-olds here you know is like so it's like kind of conversing you know like kind of not you know a couple of them just crying you know and wanting their mom you know and then you know essentially having uh you know two men come in that uh you know were screaming at us, telling us that that we were um, we'd been sold, you know, um, that we weren't going to see our parents again, that like we should get used to like being here, you know, and that you know if we like obeyed, they might consider, you know, they might consider like essentially letting us go, and um, they like you know it's it you try and do like a little bit of like pleading, but you're pretty much told to like, to, you know, to shut up, you know, and everyone's like going to do that. We're talking about small children here, you know, everyone was scared shitless. Um, and, you know, they, they essentially just like, just like, uh, like pissed on us, you know, and then, and then left. So it was just being left there, like, again, like not knowing when they were going to come back. And then they came back and then they essentially like pulled a girl on the end out of, the cage essentially and they said they had decided that they didn't eat her and that you know um that they just wanted us all to know that we were either you know we were either useful or we were meat that was a lot of times a, a term that was used like with like me like when it came to like uh slaves that were like considered you know someone to be sacrificed or whatever is they just called them meat which is fucking horrible um but essentially you know they essentially proceeded to like to to gang raper you know to for the two men to to essentially like raper and then um they ended up calling in another guy who had uh two dogs and um and you can pull up the first um image now uh basically but it was um it was the guy with like with two dogs they were german shepherds and essentially he just had um uh like like essentially tear apart the girl and that's why I know like this stuff is like incredibly graphic and really fucked up you know but it's kind of like you were saying it's like you hear child trafficking or you hear shit like this like I'm talking about you know and it's really hard to like visualize you know how you know like really how fucked up this is you know not just for like you know the girl that went through it obviously you know but also for like the kids that experienced it. And I feel like, you know, and this is why this, these memories are particularly hard for me is like, you know, they very intentionally made sure to like, to kill people in like essentially the most violent, you know, fucked up ways possible, you know? And that's like, for me is like the thing that it's like, for these people, it's no different than like mopping their floors, you know, or like, you know, like going to the grocery store or something like that. Like the amount of the amount of of guilt they feel when they allow, you know, 
some dogs to like rip up a screaming little girl in front of screaming little kids, you know, is, you know, is completely inhuman. And that's, that's the reason that like, that I really do, you know, this is really hard, but is also really like, you know, is really healing for me too. Because like I said, this is the thing that I have the hardest time with is just knowing that she went through this and that no one ever knew, you know, what she went through essentially other than her abusers who don't give a fuck you know and that to me is like is something I really cannot live with you know is like it's just fucked up you know and that's why you know and you can uh feel free to take it off the uh, screen share now um you want me to but that's really or just take it off um you want to just pull it down and we'll just pull it yeah we don't need to leave them on um but uh we can just you know show people as the things come up um but uh yeah so that's what I was saying like and that's the thing too is to realize that it's like you know the context of this is that you know they were using her death you know it was just like it was just like uh like an equation you know they were using her death just like it was almost like you know uh this then that you know like these are the batch of kids we have to traumatize and this is the thing we're going to do you know it's like who knows is this a daily thing is this a weekly thing you know is this a monthly thing who who the fuck knows you know what i mean like and that to me is like where it's like that's that i keep saying awareness but this is why you know is because it's like we're talking about very real very fucked up things and it's not an occasional thing you know like especially with what i saw you know it's like it's something that happens you know consistently and it needs to not um so essentially for 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 all of us you know it was you know being left then you know with her you know they called her called him off of her like before she had passed completely and I think that was really intentional because they like you know they just left us there with her you know like until she until she had died and everything and you know it was essentially you know being told you know to shut up because there were still kids obviously that were freaking out and everything and then you know like everyone does because you're afraid you know and essentially like they came in and pulled um essentially asked us they told us if we would if we would eat some of her that we could go basically and none of us like all of us were just like couldn't even like you know I, I can't speak for the other kids you know but me it's like I felt like I couldn't even like understand the question you know what I mean the question you know so it was just like like there was no volunteers you know except for one kid on the end essentially who like they and I think too like looking back on it it's like they this could even be like a plan you know because they're trying to like that was my experience a lot of times they would have kids that had gone through abuse that they would mix in with kids that hadn't to kind of role model you know the the behavior that they're looking for you know so so this kid you know was said he would do it you know like went over and like you know and like a, and this is why I think he was a plant you know it's like it wasn't timid it was like he was a little animal or something like that you know like and then they you know so then they they like you know called him a good boy and stuff you know and he left the room essentially with them you know and it was being you know left there with with her and then that's for me is like where where my recollection cuts out again and then comes back into essentially like where I stayed most of the rest of the experience you know the whole experience I think was maybe around two or three days but I it's really hard to say when it's this kind of stuff like it's like it feels like an eternity you know so it's it is just really hard to say um but essentially it was going from the large room to essentially you know like a cell a small room that was I, you know pretty identical you know single hanging lamp it was all concrete it was very dirty there were like you know like roaches and shit like running around and everything um and uh um you can go ahead and pull up the uh the next image you know so and then essentially this one like this was probably like the like I mean the, all the parts are like rough you know but this is probably probably like the roughest part of the memory for me, just because um, it really was just essentially being, I, I had been placed in a room in this, you know, this cell um, with another cage that was identical to my own that was essentially had like a, 
a little uh, rotting corpse in it, you know, it was a little, a little dead kid. Um, and they looked really emaciated, you know, like they had, um, sorry, like they had starved to death, basically. Um, and, um, you know, it was, it was a little, it was a little African American child. Um, and, uh, and it was just, you know, the smell of like rotting flesh in the room was overwhelming. And it was just dealing with like, you know, I've always been a very empathetic person, you know, so it's, you're, you're dealing with all like the fear, you know, of yourself being in that position, you know, of being essentially like left in this cage in a room to die, you know, and like, that's like, that's just kind of what's constantly going on in your head is like that fear. But then also you're going to have a lot of like, you're going to have a lot of empathy, you know, because it was just feeling sad knowing that that had happened, you know, to that kid, you know, that for me was really, was really difficult, you know, that it was just, you know, to be able to, you know, for hours on end, <laughs> you know, to just contemplate, you know, how sad I was for, for that kid, how sad I was for myself and not understanding why I was in that position, you know, um, that it was just, you know, it was just really horrible. And essentially it would be, um, it would be me, uh, you can go ahead and take it down now. Um, like, uh, it would just be me. Essentially, I would go back to that cell like every time, but essentially in between times, it would be like being pulled out to essentially be like raped in different ways. You know, it's like each time there was like a different kind of like theme to it it would be being taken to like another room that was really similar but a little bit bigger that had like a metal table on it and like it would be you know tied spread eagle essentially and having like you know initially it was being raped by a machine so you couldn't you had the sensation of being raped but you couldn't see anything so it was being told that it was like demons essentially you know and that you know like next time it was going to be worse and stuff so then you go you know back to the cage after after that shit you know and it's like so it's the dealing with like the um pain of that kind of stuff you know in addition because and I also had had like you know the rape memory with my dad had not happened yet so it's like so this was also my first experience with actually being fully vaginally raped as well you know was was um, you know, it had always been like, you know, fingers before, you know, so something like more drastic. This was like the first time that had been, that had been the case, you know, um, you know, and then you go back to that room essentially, you know, and then you're like, they pull you out later and then you're back in, you know, the rape room, I guess I'll call it, you know, which is essentially a spot, you know, and this time it's someone dressed as, uh, as Lucifer, you know, basically a devil, you know, big horns and shit like that, you know, and they're, and they're the ones that that's like raping you essentially. And then it's back into the cell essentially. And then there was like a third time essentially that I got pulled out. And this time was like, you know, the biggest like mind fuck is that, you know, you are, you've had the other two times, you're really freaked out, you know, and who walks in, but is Jesus basically. And so you think like, you know, obviously someone that looks like Jesus, like, like I, I love Jesus. I'm like, I know this is not, you know, this is like the, the shittiest fucking interpretation, you know, like facade of like this crap ever, you know? So it's essentially, you know, like someone who comes in as Jesus it initially seems like they're there to like rescue you essentially, you know, and be listening. And so you start pouring your heart out to him about like all the shit that you've been going through you know and essentially he just responds by calling you a liar and telling you you should be ashamed for being a bad girl and stuff and then um proceed to essentially like 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 rape me with like a crucifix like basically and that's like a memory that I would have to deal with like a lot throughout my life when I was dealing with like whenever I was disclosing and stuff a lot of times I would have to deal with like a body memory of essentially being sexually assaulted you know and that's what you know it would it would usually it would come back to is essentially this incident you know where it's like you know you start talking you know and that part of you is still in that place and is still scared shitless and is like is like no like I have to do anything I can to like you know deter her from talking about this stuff because it's you know it's like gonna make us bad it's gonna make us a liar all these things that they tell you you know essentially like that it's that's you that's the bad one you know not the not that you're oh 
like a victim, you know, in the situation, it's always that you're complicit. It's your fault that you're going through this or you want to be going through this. It's always that mind game, you know? So it was essentially being brought back, you know, to, to the cell again. Um, and then there was a last time, like where we got brought into like the big room and there was multiple kids there again, essentially. And for that one, um, uh, they, I mean, this was just kind of like another trauma to like seal the deal, essentially. And you can pull up the the next one. Um, and that was just basically that they pulled, you know, it was always the illusion that it was that we were all on the same footing. But I really think that, you know, that they had some kids planted in these cages to create different illusions, you know, because like I said, from early on, on the last, uh, which I'm gonna call it the last interview, you know, they always made it really clear that there were throwaway slaves and then they're were you know there were ones that they were willing to invest some time and money and everything and effort into basically um and that you always wanted to be that second group because the first group is essentially not going to you know is not you're not going to enjoy your life very much um so uh so for this one they like they essentially told us you know that this kid had kind of had kind of failed had had proved that he wasn't going to be useful and stuff and that they didn't need him anymore so they ended up pulling them out essentially and like um one of them like lit like the corner of his shirt on fire basically and then like a couple of them had like things of lighter fluid um and they just you know and you know once he started to freak out when he knows he was on fire they just doused him in in lighter fluid you know and you know obviously he went up in flames and he you know running around and screaming and stuff and they told him to shut up and just kind of like they just kind of like kicked him like essentially and he ended up like like falling over onto the ground and just kind of like I mean just kind of curling up and dying you know and it was just like you know it's like at that point there wasn't any screaming or anything from any of us you know because at that point we knew like that like there was the expectation you know was that we were going to be quiet that we were going to behave you know like all that different shit you know but you know on the inside like I mean it was you know it's I've always had a huge phobia of like, of like fire, you know, for sure. Like, but it's like, you know, on a certain level is normal, but, you know, but on another level, you know, and you can go ahead and pull that off, you know, um, when you're, when you're done with it. Um, but uh, yeah, so, I mean, so it was kind of the thing to really like seal the deal that it's like that these people, you know, really have control like over your life a hundred percent, you know, that they decide whether you live or die and if you die, how you die, you know, because that's, that's what, you know, it really showed you, you is like, in my opinion, you know, like, I mean, any way to go is going to be rough, you know, but really it's like, it's like the three ways that they showed, you know, just like being forgotten in a room and starving to death or, you know, the burning or the dog, you know, it's, it's some of the worst, it's some of the most like, you know, like painful, violent things that you could go with, you know, and it, and it really like, you know, it really does like, you know, just seal the deal with you, you know, that like that you're, you know, and when you're so young that it's like, you know, that there are two versions of reality, you know, there's the version of reality that you grew up with, you know, and then there's like this, there's this fucking hell essentially that exists, you know, too. And it feels like you can, you know, at any moment, like, you know, get plopped right back there, you know, and so essentially it was having the whole the whole incident and then it cuts out again and then flashes back to being in the hospital bed, you know, for, you know, like a first day essentially being really groggy and tied down and then just being up and like walking around and it being some of the other kids, the other kids, you know, that had been in the cages too. But it's like, but now it's like back to the pediatrician ward where it's like everyone is super like all the nurses and everyone super sweet and very you know it's the love bombing kind of stuff you know where it's like your reality just went from being like I'm gonna like you know die in this hellhole to now you're in like a place that's like immaculately clean and like all the people are very nice and very attentive to your needs and I mean a lot of it too is I'm sure just because they're just really trying to like watch and see if they can elicit any like you know if they're trying to see the at the level of dissociation i'm sure you know from all that kind of stuff because it's like you know 
they want to know, you know, that you're, that you're going to leave there and essentially not, you know, not talk about what just happened and everything, but, and that, you know, that you are the uh, level of dissociative that they're interested in, you know, if like, if you're kind of going to come out and start talking about that shit right away, then that, you know, that's not someone they're going to program, you know, because the only people they program are people that can keep secrets, you know, so um, that's, and involuntarily keep secrets, you know, by creating walls in their head, you know, so um yeah so so basically you know it was you know being there and then having my dad you know come and pick me up you know and it feel you know it did feel like a very surreal experience you wonder like you know sometimes you would have little memories of like what had happened and it was like was it a dream like maybe I was sick or something you know or like you know is there it's you you know as an adult you wouldn't know how to wrap your head around it but especially as like a kid you know having no context you know for stuff so it you know it was my dad picking me up you know and feeling like grateful to see him you know too because it's like you know they seem nice but I still had weird feelings there you know for obvious reasons so like I went back home with my dad when my mom was still gonna be gone for like a long period of time so and this is one thing that Prince Springmeyer mentions in his book that a lot of times the core trauma you know it like they really need the caregiver to kind of like seal the deal with stuff you know so essentially like it was just kind of another situation where I felt like I had been kind of rescued you know I was going to go someplace familiar where I understood stuff you know even if it was with my dad who was like just had just been starting to like binge drink and do all that stuff since my mom had left um but you know what ended up happening is you know like we went home my dad continued on the binge drinking and stuff and within the within like I, not that first night, but the next night, like he essentially uh, ended up raping me for like for the first time vaginally, like too. So it's like it really is like it feels like at that point, like there's no safe place as a kid. You know, it makes it very like it very easy to see that like you know as fucked up as sexual abuse is, it's like the least fucked up of all that like the least painful at least of all the other abuse so it makes it very easy to train like a sex kitten or something at that point you know to be like hey like you know like this is like being a sex object is like the safest form of abuse you know what I mean it's the best way to be you know or something like and that's how you can get like the the crazy parts you know that they that they go off of you know so that's when it comes to like this memory that's where like each of the events that I had talked about in um right or at least the early ones I had talked about in the initial um interview you know it's like they a lot of times would start off like creating a part you know or triggering a part with the same trauma that was around like the uh initial uh that initial event that, you know, was just like, you know, a very long trauma event, essentially. So when they were trying to create the dog altar, um, the, uh, the, um, whatchamacallit, like the, sorry, the wolf altar, um, they made sure to like start that off with essentially showing like a kitten be ripped apart by a Rottweiler. And it's like, and that kind of like re-triggers like the same, you know, kind of trauma of like that initial event, you know, and essentially kind of just kind of gets you, gets you ready for more programming for that, that part, you know, to be out and conscious for them to essentially then continue to like, um, you know, instruct or train or, or do different things with, you know, so and so with that one, you know, it really was about then them getting me to kill a kitten. So that like I had mentioned, so that that was that was, you know, the stair, like the, the steps that they take, you know, to essentially, um, you know, take a kid that would not be violent, even a little bit, you know, but it's like when you have all this stuff of this initial memory, like in the, in your subconscious, in the back of your mind, on a certain level, like the resistance from the parts of you that don't want to do that is only going to go so far, because there's a lived experience of other parts of this insane stuff, you know, that really cannot, you can't talk out of, you know, like the kitten's life over yours, you know, at that point, like that part is, you know, is a hundred percent survival, you know, so, and they're like, they don't see things, you know, it's easy to start creating a psychopathic or wolf-like alter, you know, out of something like a, a part of you that's already decided that there's, you know, there's no hope in the world and no use being a little girl or anything like that, you know, so 
um so yeah and that's that's the thing too with that like you know is that really like if you know you're going to be doing some kennel training with me later is like is you have all these associations in my head too where with with the wolf altar with the dog altar the dog altar was just more of a sex altar it was just for bestiality type films um that were always in this kennel that was kind of like outside of like san antonio texas area um but uh um when it came to like the those altars you know like a huge part of their programming was that like other dogs you know you see they you want to create the if you're if you're kennel training I've never actually really done it with dogs I think probably because it would be too triggering for me but I like you know it's like if you're kennel training a dog you know like that basically you know like you want them to associate their kennel as a safe place as a like their den their home you know like it's like their little room or something and that's very much what they do too with like the dog and the wolf training and stuff like that is that they want you to like associate, you know, they want you to associate the person who's your master as like the person who like you rely on for your food and all your affection, you know, and then you have your kennel, you know, as the place where you don't experience any abuse and you're excited to go back to, you know, and for, for me, like, it's like, it, it would be easy to see like how that, you know, could be implanted in that kid, especially when you were comparing the, the two cages <laughs> to each other, you know, because there was one cage that's in just like the hospital, an immaculately clean place. It's stainless steel. It's like all shiny. There's no bad smells, you know, there's a nice blanket in there. Like there's all this stuff, you know, and then subconsciously you're also remembering that there, the cage could be a very different kind of cage, you know, one that's like covered in fucking shit and roaches and stuff, you know, and like, and in, in a very horrible setting, you know, with a lot of unknowns, you know, when you have that, you know, and then you create this like dog or like wolf altar, you know, that then did like the violent stuff, you know, for them, it's very like, you know, it's like, well, you know, this, this is like heaven, you know, <laughs> Because for them, they don't they don't have the context of having like a normal kid life, you know, like they're, they're always called out when they're traumatized, you know, so for them, it's like, well, this is awesome. I love just pleasing my master and doing this stuff, because this is the thing that makes me feel like the world is predictable and safe and everything. And then, you know, you take a kid like that, and then you just multiple years, you keep pulling out that same part, keep traumatizing them, you know, and that's, you know, that's how you end up getting adults that are super soldiers and sleeper people, you know, and people that, you know, or end up being, you know, survivors that are self-destructing in, you know, like sex work and stuff like that, you know, it's, you know, it's a lot of it. It's just, it's almost like the altars that we created for ourselves, like run, run rampant. And just because we don't understand like what the dynamic that we're kind of perpetuating within ourselves, you know, um, so um, I, uh, I'm going to follow up, you know, the end of finalize this event, you know, with this last image, essentially, which is, um, this is how I kind of recommend survivors do journaling. Um, and I myself do journaling is that I always try and make sure to like, not just journal like what happened, but also what I wish would have happened. Essentially, that's like a lot of what we do in EMDR or different things that it's like, you know, as part of processing the memory, you know, a lot of times I'll be dealing with like anger, you know, working with like my punching bag and a baseball bat or something or some target practice or something. And just like visualizing, you know, like in, in the violent memories, like, like having gone back in and like taken out the abusers and that met and rescued the kids as opposed to like having been forced to offend on another kid or something, you know, and it's, it's all visualization, but it's a very healing and empowering, you know, for us to really, to really recognize that, like, that the event is over. And like, now we can use some, some visualization to essentially like create, um, to create some some healing and peace and for me that is always going to be based on spirituality spirituality is always number one for the basis of everything so for this uh particular like photo it was just like a uh, um it was just, oh yeah 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 you, you can show it briefly you know it's a it was just that, like so the hunt? oh no it was the last one it should have been the last one after um okay no, no, it's totally fine. This one. I think there was only three on that one. Oh, maybe I forgot the last one. 
it's not a big deal. It's, it's basically like a mother earth, um, type woman that's like just kind of like cradling like a little child basically lots of flowers around and stuff um so essentially like that's usually what I do to um to kind of like create some closure with the journaling and everything is I can't literally go back and save those kids I can't literally go back and save myself but if I can you know create some like mental peace you know especially for that part of like just giving them like some understanding of what they went through and some like just like being like you know what like what would have been the ideal outcome in this situation and like you know and just kind of reiterating that like that we're adult like in an adult body now it's not we're not in the same position that we were as children you know and and that for me is like is is the biggest part you know even for this kind of stuff I constantly come back to and people say you know freaks you out of course and people say you know like you're so brave it's so risky and all this shit you know like yes it is like I mean what the my whole life like the shit I went through was like really fucking risky but at this point it feels like more risky to be quiet about stuff because I'm healing anyway than than to than to not you know because you know if at this point you know if some extreme level of harassment comes like I'm going to have a lot of people that are aware of why you know um and that that did serve me well the first time I came out about the incest you know just with my dad and uncle you know was because they you know they did I wouldn't be surprised if the two comments you or a few comments that you deleted were from my family because that's the thing that's what I've come that's what I've that's what I've come to realize is that, you know, that the the pool of people that are not okay with me sharing this information or are interested in calling me crazy or saying I need attention or, you know, all, all the things or, or my dad tells people that um, his, his reasoning for all this is that he tells people that I was gang raped in college and that, that just, that just addled my brain, I guess. So now I decided to like accuse my dad and, and uncle and then the whole other network of people essentially of like molesting me my whole childhood. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense, you know? <laughs> but I thought it was really interesting that he said gang raped in college. Cause I was like, wow, it's interesting that you'd know that I've been gang raped, you know, like, you know, and, but that's the thing they don't know as uh, abusers, you know, how much you're remembering. They just are shitting themselves cause you're remembering. <laughs> you know so they're going to do whatever they can to cover their tracks you know so I I heard it all you know that I was like uh, you know that I was crazy and there's all the all the stuff you know but what I realized was that you know the bulk of of everyone else you know especially people that really I, I saw a lot and their opinions mattered to me more in my life like we're all incredibly supportive and a lot of people shared their own stories you know of of experiencing similar things and that was just so healing you know so so it really like, I mean, it, it really is like, like I, I anticipate getting some stuff, you know, like there's going to be some people that are and plenty of people that are not happy that I'm, that I'm speaking out, you know, but that doesn't mean that I, sh- I shouldn't do it because I do have hope that, you know, at some point, you know, we're going to have enough, enough awareness to actually like, you know, um, actually do something about everything. So, um, I was going to, you know, grab some water. Um, Do you have any like questions or anything about uh, what I just kind of went over? Or do you want to just get into like a few of the questions if we have time? What are you feeling? Yeah, I was going to comment on what you were saying with the the last image that we didn't show um, with creating a positive outcome. I really like that too, because I think that guilt that you feel surviving something like that and that helplessness and that shame of like caring, that's it. Such a heavy fucking weight, you know, a child, an adult, anybody like, thank you for sharing that. I didn't thank you for that. That was absolutely horrific. And I'm so sorry that you went through that. And I'm so sorry for all the children that are going through that. And that is why it's important to talk about it. But I think creating that positive outcome, like you didn't have a choice to experience any of that. You were forced to do it. And so that shame of how they make you feel like it's all your fault, you know, and it's your guys's fault that all that all this stuff happens, being able to look at it from an empathetic point of view and saying, if I were to be, you know, the the leader of that room with all those children in it, like, what would I have done with those children? Yeah. And something beautiful from that and to say like this is what I would do you know like the children would be playing or they'd be happy or this would be the outcome I think that's like really powerful with like reclaiming your power back because they do 
put those thoughts in your mind that you chose that outcome and that you had something to do with it. And it's your fault. And that that's going to be you if you don't comply, you know, yeah. so I really love that tip. Cause I don't know if people would automatically think of doing that even with journaling, but I think that that's really powerful because it, it exercises your brain to have freedom of choice and to have free will, yeah. again, you know, and to realize that like, if you were the, you know, if you were the leader of that room, like you would have not done what the leaders of, of, of the room at that time, whenever you were a child did, you know? Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you sharing that because that's extremely positive and and an uplifting way to, you know, view something so incredibly horrific. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one thing I think that like, I learned in EMDR, but I learned early on that I could use in journaling too, you know, is that we, we try and we want to focus, you know, especially for that, for that, it's like a little part of us that needs to get rescued that's still been stuck in that situation, you know, and really it's like the best way to, to heal the, and to heal the quickest is just to kind of like be very open and without judgment, both to the hard shit that comes out, but also sometimes like the kind of like silly comforting kid shit that comes out, you know, as like, you know, cause you'll have, times for sure where it's just it feels like the thing you need to ground yourself feels very childlike and and not rational you know but in my experience like you're really you're really denying part of yourself when it comes to that and that's like that's a huge part of it is like for kids is like our our imaginations were like used against us you know as a kid so now it's like like you're saying giving that that part a chance to be like you know like we have the power to do any you know to imagine anything now you know and and the thing for me too that I constantly come back to is like like I, I had mentioned before you know like like with the um you know retaliation type things because it's like you know even with like that part it was always like the hardest to convince that to share stuff you know just even with like my partner my therapist anything you know because it does feel like so dangerous and everything but um but when it comes down to it you know like that that little part like really it it can only like be kind of brought into the present essentially if like we um we like listen to all the needs I guess basically like without any any judgment or any restriction or anything like that and and um, sorry, I got off track, you know, but sorry, when it came to using your imagination, you know, for, um, for your stuff, like, it's also about like changing the clothing of the part and everything. So in my experience, you know, like the part will always be dressed in like what, like that, either the role that part felt like they had to have, whether it was a non-human thing or something, or it'll just be like a little kid version of yourself that's still wearing the same clothes and everything. So a huge part of it for me is just, you know, just even just asking that part of myself, like internally and sometimes painting and journaling about it, like, what would you like to wear? You know, and it's it's sometimes it's princess dresses and so depending on the part, you know, it's like, and, but in my experience, like that's, that's really the thing that, that creates some healing, you know, is, is that you like, it's almost like parts of yourself, you were never able to like express fully. And the more you can do that, the more you're going to feel empowered, the more you're going to realize that like, most of what the abusers told you were like, complete lies, you know, and that, you know, you are like, expressing yourself isn't going to just get you ridicule, it isn't going to get you, you know, a slap in the face or something like that. It's going to get you, you know, a lot of support and understanding and everything. Um, but yeah, sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought. <laughs> no, that was great. You didn't even, you know, that was a beautiful response. I just wanted you to know that, you know, it's learning, I think, positive outcomes and just having having different tools in somebody's toolbox can be so healing. And I love the artistic side of it because I haven't talked about that, you know, that side of it, aside from just maybe handwriting, which is still really powerful, but I love the the artistic side and the creative the creativity that you bring to healing. I think some people will relate to, and maybe they haven't heard that as much. So I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, I just remembered like what the track I was going on because this is I, I think helpful for some people. So like we said, matching like positive outcome for sure. But sometimes also the other thing for me is to essentially deal with my anxiety by gaming out the worst case scenario, especially for those for the kid parts. Because a lot of times, like what they think is the worst case scenario is like not 
not real essentially, you know, like, or can't exist or something like that, you know? So, um, so for example, you know, for this part who I had mentioned had, you know, was really scared about like me sharing, you know, with anyone or getting in like way of therapy or creating a lot of body pain or different stuff. Like I, you know, I, at a certain point had to be like, you know, like the worst fear for that part is, is going back to that place, literally, you know, and it was kind of like, really like, you know, getting like, like it's like an adult talking to a child, you know, to be like, you know, like we're we have an adult body now. I have like a completely different understanding of of spirituality, of the fact that all things are temporary, you know, and like and I can't say that I'm not gonna go in some horribly, you know, violent way. You know what I mean? There's people getting car accidents every day. You know, I just lost a friend a couple of weeks ago in a car accident suddenly, you know. So the thing is we we don't know you know, death is part of life and we know we're all going to go somehow. And that's kind of like where I come to it with that part is like, even if like worst case scenario, I got picked up tomorrow and thrown back into that spot. And it was like the worst case thing, you know, we were in that cage and going to be fucking left in a room for like, till we died, you know, or something like that. Like, I don't know how to describe the level to which that doesn't have the same level of fear for me anymore, because the thing is, I have been a practicing Buddhist for many years prior to like coming back to Jesus, you know, recently in like the past like year and stuff, but I still, I still practice a lot of meditation. I still practice a lot of stuff in my mind. And I know from Buddhism that, you know, we're going to go through a lot of fucked up things in life that we don't have any control over, you know, and even something that fucked up is temporary, you know, and there's not going to be the same level of like, fear, essentially, at least for myself, you know, that there that there was before, because I'm going to understand that that's the case, too. I'm an adult now, you know, like, so it's kind of like really showing that that kid that like that, like, okay, worst case scenario, like the worst thing in the world happens, like, we're still going to be able to handle it, you know, because ultimately, we're not we're not in the same place that we were before, you know? And and that's the thing that I constantly come back to with people is like a lot of times that's what holds them back from journaling or doing different stuff is they feel like it's going to, once they get it on the, if they're getting it out of here and out here, you know, even if it's just putting it on words on a page that somehow it's going to make it more real. It's going to bring you right back there. It's going to make you feel, the thing is you're never going to feel as helpless as you did then. And that's the thing, like, that's why I encourage people to do the journaling because you'll think what's going to happen is you're going to put the shit on page and it's going to make it more real and more overwhelming, but it's always the opposite that happens. It's like, for some reason, just bringing that into your reality, it just takes all of the intensity down. It connects the right and left side of your brain, the emotional and like, the physical brings you into the present and allows that part to be like, oh, like I put this on page and nothing happened. <laughs> Not, like nothing happened. Like, like it's like the world didn't cave in on me. I didn't like explode of like shame or grief or, you know, like anger or something like that. You know, if anything, it just keeps, you know, it just like, oh, I feel a little bit better, <laughs> you know, like, and so, but it's still something I go through, you know, is that, is that resistance, you know, for, uh, for journaling and stuff, but it is like, you know, like, you know, this is pretty much like my journaling tips part, <laughs> you know, that, that I had wanted to get to, you know, which is just that, you know, don't hold back when it comes to the bad shit, the good shit. Like you really, if you are a survivor, that's like, you know, and even if not, to be honest, like, I feel, cause I feel like people could benefit from this kind of work, even if they're just dealing with like, you know, childhood bullying or different types of trauma like that, that aren't necessarily as like, like, okay, like I need to get completely in touch with a completely dissociated part of myself, you know, that's like freaking out and triggered and everything. It really, it really goes a long way to us like exploring, you know, our minds and our motivations and our behaviors and everything. And a lot of times, like the things that we do that are fucked up in our life, like just comes from like a lack of like understanding, I think, and awareness of like why, we're behaving a certain way, you know, so and it's a lot of times it's stupid shit from our from our childhood. And when you can realize that it's like, damn, like, I don't why am I still living this way? <laughs> right, 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 right. That's so helpful. I love that you shared that. And I know that's going to be helpful. And I mean, stuff like that can be helpful, even if you haven't gone through the types of traumas that you have, you know, even if it's just, and I don't want to say just all trauma is relative to the person. So I'm not trying to discount trauma. But what I'm saying is you don't have to go through satanic ritual abuse to find value in what, you know, the advice that Carrie's given. I think that all of this, you know, all of us have trauma on some level 
and figuring out how to navigate that and to get it out of our body and how to express it. There's so many different ways that we can do that, you know, and I think like anybody can benefit from picking up a pen or some markers or some paint and some paper or canvas and just getting whatever it is that's stuck in us out, you know? So I, I love that you offer that and that there's so many different ways that we can use that creatively to our advantage in our healing journeys. Yeah. Thank you so much. I like, I'm, I, I hope it makes sense to people. I feel like sometimes that I just, I, I maybe have too many metaphors or I'm just like all over the place. So if it's like, and it all comes from just like me, you know, trying to break it down for myself or a lot of times trying to break it down for other parts, because the thing is, is like, you know, like all to try and get like all my parts on board for journaling or all of them on board for therapy or different stuff like that, like is, you know, sometimes it's sometimes a challenge, you know, because they're, they're like, until you have a level of integration, to where like everyone knows they're on the same team, like they are now for me, like, like they're, you know, leading up to that point, you know, there was still, you know, it's like herding cats, <laughs> you know? And so you have to, like, in my experience, in my, my, a lot of my benefit in therapy and different stuff is I had to learn how to explain things to my kid parts, you know, that were scared. I had to learn how to explain things to my persecutor parts, you know, who are really just bullies because they were all so scared, you know, but really it's like, so like journaling, for example, like that's usually the main parts people want to avoid talking to is because they sound like they're abusers or they sound like, you know, a demon or all kinds of things, you know, that they were essentially created to sound like, you know, to help, you know, help maintain the system order essentially in favor of the abusers. So um, really like, like you have to, like, in my experience, that's like where the most benefit comes from in journaling too. It's the most resistance, but it's also the most benefit because most of the time you just have to, in my, my experience, I just recommend asking questions, you know, like, like, oh, like if they're insulting you or they're saying things have to be a certain way that isn't healthy to just be like, why, like, why is that the case? Why is that what you think, you know? And what a lot of times what you'll end up finding, you know, is persecutor parts are essentially bullying the system, you know, creating a lot of self-destructive habits or something, because it's like, we talked about my early memory. It's, it's going to be a very traumatized part of you that feels like, oh, like I, I need you to be a certain way, essentially to protect the body, you know, to protect the core of yourself that we're trying to keep dissociated, you know, from all this crazy shit. Like you have to like, like subconsciously, we know what the abusers want, even if the front person in daily life doesn't. So there's always going to be this subconscious control in the background where they're trying to, trying to do things. But as adults, it ends up coming out in very self-destructive ways and addiction and, you know, just really bad self-talk, all kinds of stuff. And it really does take like, like, you know, in my experience, that's also the main thing to like move therapy forward is like where you feel like you have resistance, you have to take time to create understanding and like coming on to like an even footing, just like you would with like any relationship, you know, if you guys are both yelling at each other and coming from two different places, then it's like, you're never going to get anywhere. So there has to be, you know, and, and the thing is, as a front person, we're the adult, we're the ones that have spent the most time, you know, in present life. So it's always our responsibility to like, not feed into like the crazy bullying or like the all the crazy stuff you know and to try our hardest to like investigate it and create some understanding because in my experience those parts are also parts that tend to have the most strength and create you know the most like almost stability within the system once they are healed you know yes 100 percent. that makes such sense and again i love your metaphors because it just brings so much clarity to some things that are very unfamiliar to you know, what we learn, obviously we're not taught this, but also what we personally experience a lot of us, you know, we don't go through that. So it, it's, it can be very hard for people who haven't to just even comprehend what that's like. And you do such a great job breaking it down. And I thought while we're on this topic, I know some people had questions about healing. That yeah. sentence. So if you don't mind, I'd love to piggyback off of that. I thought a really great question was, um, did you have any booby traps or hardest obstacles, biggest obstacles, I should say, in your programming? And like, how do you overcome that if if faced with an obstacle? It's always going to be about internal investigation. And yes, like I have always experienced a lot of booby traps, you know, like they're like, 
a core, like this core memory created a very strong urge for suicide, basically, because, you know, you don't have any context for there being any way out of that situation other than to die. And you don't really know as a four-year-old what that means, you know, really like much other than what you're witnessing and different stuff, but it's just like, it's, it's like this abstract end to things. So essentially, you know, they build a lot of like, for me, like a lot of like suicide programming off of that kind of stuff where essentially like it's like you'll like it will call up that memory you know um but a lot of times like with this like the booby traps in my experience you know they're they're almost like they're almost like disembodied like um like physical symptoms and stuff like you'll typically feel really strong physical symptoms but the parts because they're so traumatized are usually like very not interested in interacting and are very like resistant to healing and very afraid because they're very like core type core type memories you know so so yeah so I would say like like booby traps essentially like not to give them too much like uh power essentially like sometimes when we think about programming or booby traps or stuff it, it almost creates this idea that there's like something foreign that was like put into us that we have no control over and you know there is a lot of manipulation to create what's going on in our heads, you know, and to convince parts of ourselves that they need to do what the abusers want. But ultimately, it's, it's all just yourself. It's all just manipulation of a kid that's gotten you to believe something, you know. So sometimes when we think about like booby traps, like as survivors, like think, ask yourself if you're thinking of it as like a literal thing, because if you're thinking of it as like, oh, I'm about to like, to step into something like scary, or like, like, so, um, have things like uh that make it feel like um there was like an earthquake in the system like and that there was like it's like everything was like uh, my whole world is about to like shake apart like there a lot of times it's like big overwhelming sensations you know that one was like created by being um like raped while being blindfolded and then uh you also had like ear covers and stuff so essentially you had like all your sensation was just like 100% just being like violently raped but you didn't have like a lot of other sensations to go with it and then they uh, essentially kind of like instruct that part, you know, that they're like, that they're like an earthquake and that, you know, anything, anytime, you know, certain shit, you know, gets brought up, you know, that this is like the essentially, and for that one, it was like, if there was fuckery, it's that either discovery of like the physical structure of like the system that they created, you know, that they modeled my, my parts on. Um, if, if there was an attempt of me to, to see it or to modify it basically, um, cause that came a lot later on in healing, uh, that, that there would be like this sensation that, you know, that, you know, it, I was shaking the foundations of my whole universe, you know, and that I could not go any further because if I did, you know, it, and it, so a lot of it's really overwhelming sensations and stuff. So that's the main thing to just come back to is that like, when we're talking about booby traps or stuff, we're not talking about like literal physical things that are going to go off inside you and create a chain of events that you will have no control over. That's not the case, even a little bit. It's always going to be a like little traumatized part of yourself that feels like they have to be putting you through whatever the booby trap is, you know, to essentially punish you for stepping into an area in your healing or in your life that you're not supposed to, you know? So, so I had mentioned the first time the cutting, that was a good example, you know, where like, you know, he, my uh my main handler had essentially con talked me convinced a part you know that we needed to uh cut ourselves at any time that we had been sexual with anyone that was not cult related or not sanctioned by our handler essentially so like when i was out partying in college i mean very promiscuous like the next morning i would end up or sometimes there were the morning after I had been with him and he just wanted, he essentially just wanted to like reinforce some other programming, you know, it would, you know, the next morning there would just be the insatiable urge for me to cut myself, you know, and then I would do it. And then I, once I was done, I felt fine, you know, which is most people's experience with cutting in general is that you just, you know, you do it when, you know, you have emotional overwhelm and stuff. But for my therapist, they were like, I don't understand why it's starting now. It's always like, like a childhood thing, like, like, or it's a teenage thing, but that's what people don't understand is like, 
until until my college days it's like I was I was the perfect kid I was like totally unlocked you know straight A student no negative emotions never got grounded no like no nothing like I like to everyone I was the perfect child you know <laughs> like and, and but it's because you're fucking afraid you know <laughs> like I didn't get to be like who I wanted to be I had to be had to be who I had to be you know and that's that's was my experience well, that's even enlightening in itself, because I think that's the other thing, you know, we have such a skewed way of considering what abuse could look like, not just considering what an abuser looks like, but what somebody who is being abused looks like. Yeah. People wouldn't expect that maybe the straight A valid Victorian, you know, perfect, you know, uh, star of the football team child that's like standing in front of them, you know, on graduation night saying a speech could have done mm-hmm. everything that you did. But I find more and more of the cases that's that's exactly the person, you know, the archetype person that is going through this a lot of the times at these high levels. Because again, like you are very smart, like higher than average IQ, like higher than average athletic capabilities, like that ability to perform well and just I don't know about the athletic thing I still think that's something that like (laughs) that like that it even in my hunting stuff it wasn't something that was pushed too much but it was more so there's different stuff like I had mentioned like even the weapon skills like my stuff is still pretty rudimentary because there was always this like understanding that like you're gonna uh like once you're really needed you know that they're gonna just pick you up and finish off the training that they need so you have like updates to training and stuff like that like throughout your life you know but so yeah so that's all I would say you know I've never been but but to be honest like so that in my experience if we wanted to piggyback this on booby traps you know is my is my experience of like shutdown kind of stuff so essentially like because you know they didn't want me to be sexual like they didn't want me to be violent you know that it's like when I would start my behaviors would start veering into those directions essentially like it's like there there would be a lot of um a lot of punishment a lot of booby traps for example so I started having um exercise induced asthma during uh during my middle school time um because I like I had started sparring in my taekwondo class basically so like the I was great at like katas and doing all that kind of stuff but as soon as it was like the the physical hand-to-hand stuff even though I had been trained in all of this stuff, you know, like for years, like prior when it came to all the like NWO soldier wolf training type stuff, like that it's like that it was known, you know, for my system, that's like the sex, not being sexual with someone I wasn't supposed to, I wasn't supposed to be violent or physically capable. You know, I was a total bookworm, you know, inside painting all day, you know, never felt comfortable in my body. I was not supposed to feel comfortable in my body, you know, and feel capable, you know, and, and that's like, and that's something that I experienced is like when, when I was in the position of sparring and all of a sudden the adrenaline hit, it was, it was almost like I had experienced a lot of like, um, like, like shutdown type booby traps where I start, I would start having, you know, exercise induced asthma. They said, you know, like basically where, you know, to me, it feels very similar to panic attacks too. You know, you just, you just can't breathe, you know, like, and you feel like, you know, like you, like you have no energy and like all that stuff. And, and that's a lot of also what I experienced feeling I when I was dealing with those memories coming up again I dealt with that same thing over again of being like oh my god like do I have asthma and then investigating with that part and being like oh, okay like no this is like essentially like me you know us tapping into the part of ourselves you know like learning about you know like the violent part of ourselves that had wanted to you know to share and heal and everything but it's it still comes along with you know with more awareness but still comes along with all those same shutdown kind of kind of feelings so dealing with like waves of heavy fatigue and not having any energy or like uh like i said the um it's going to say like random body aches you know just like all all your joints or the um uh sorry the first thing i mentioned yeah regardless it's like you know, like the the breathing kind of thing shortness of breath it's like you'll you'll experience you know those kinds of things but that like i was saying like i i constantly come back to like not not giving it that much power you know like not really thinking like oh my god i'm going to stop breathing you know and just recognizing that like this is 
something, you know, it goes a long way to realize that something psychosomatic or like journal about it or something. And, and like, cause sometimes we will have more control over survive as survivors over stuff like that. than we realize like once we investigate it. Yes. That was a great answer. And I mean, that's, it's really phenomenal like what our bodies are capable of doing unconsciously, you know, and not that every child that has asthma is, you know, programmed, but like that doesn't come up in conversations at all. People don't consider yeah. in any case, and it doesn't have to just be programmed. I'm sure like something like asthma can be onset from, you know, other types of, you know, trauma too, potentially. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, but yeah. it's like, we don't take that into well, the placebo effect. Like it's the, you know, it's, you know, that's, it's pretty much like it's using your body's ability for the placebo effect, but it's like weaponizing it essentially. Yes. A hundred percent. So this, I don't know, I, to me, it makes me have more empathy and it makes me ask more questions about stuff instead of just accepting that somebody's sick or, you know, has an illness. I mean, it's so common with survivors that they have different brain body injuries that they deal with chronically throughout their life. And some of it starts to dissipate when they start to heal those areas. If, if, you know, that's possible for that injury, you know, but it's like, we're not taught that, that chronic pain or inflammation in our body or just dysfunction or disease could be related to trauma. We're always associated that it has to be something physical that we feel on our body, you know, and, and it's, it's like that book, the body keeps the score. It really does, you know, mm -hmm. like our body remembers trauma, you know, and I, I love that you say like internal investigation. Cause I think like if more of us did that and looked in and said like, why, why do I have pain here? Why does this injury always seem to reoccur? Or like, why do I have the sore spot on my body? Or why do I have, you know, asthma attacks once in a while, whatever it is, I, I would guarantee that a lot of things that manifest in our body over time, do you have some type of relation to some type of a negative emotion also, you know, yeah. and I think survivors really do bring that to light and shine a light on that aspect. Cause I mean, it's, it's totally erased if it was ever taught anyways in, you know, in medicine, especially here in America. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it, there's a very like, you know, I mean, and, and medicine is even getting more and more uh, like, proving it more and more the the mind body connection you know and that's a lot of like when I mentioned satanic panic before like that's that's why like all of like all of this stuff we're talking about has been suppressed like intentionally <laughs> you know like like the the diso like the study of dissociation and trauma and its effects you know like everyone knew all of that shit since like world war ii and like the nazis like essentially like standardized like abuse and and studying it essentially you know so really you know this i yeah it, it it's been known for so long by like the enemy <laughs> eventually by the people that use it against us and it's frustrating because whenever it's like stuff starts coming to light in like the general public they just make it seem like it's bullshit but in general that's why i'm like really optimistic now is because it, it is true just like scholarly articles that you can find on the effects of trauma or stuff dissociation all that stuff you know like like i said you know false memory syndrome foundation is like not in the dsm-5 but dissociation is you know so it's something that you know little by little you know they're they're trying to put their spin on thing on people becoming aware of stuff by kind of glorifying the stranger the stranger things aspect of things you know or like uh you know making it seem like cool to be like a fucking so super soldier or something as if like you didn't go through things like I talked about like earlier in this episode you know which is like you know like like there's no level of like you know like cool I can use a gun or knife skills that would be worth you know going through shit like that or witnessing shit like that you know and that's that's but that's how it's presented right now you know in popular culture is that rituals are just like a fun thing people do where you get to dress up you know and like and you know and and you know stranger things or other things that are all that you know trauma-based program soldiers you know are just like are just like cool you know like yeah it sucks like what she went through but how cool would it be to have those abilities you know and it's like 
Yeah. Like you listen to my episodes and then tell me that you would go through that just to feel like you could fucking like throw someone against the wall with your mind, you know, like 99% of the time, that's not what you get. You get, you know, you get, you know, skills that they give you for their ends, you know, <laughs> like, and not things that you would have chosen to want to do if like you had a choice in it, you know, it's not like, yay, I get to go be like, you know, they didn't like program me to be the best mural artist in the world, you know, <laughs> like. <laughs> right, yeah, a hundred percent, yes. And somebody actually asked a question that what you just said reminded me of. Somebody had asked, um, any helpful aspects basically are there any aspects of your programming that that serve you well so i don't know so we'll say yes we'll say yes and no um in general like anyone's going to be a better version of themselves without the programming like just like period end of story like because all the like quote unquote skills or things that you might have that like the normal person doesn't came at like a huge cost to where you can't really like use it like a normal person would, you know? So it's like, so, um, so basically like I, I would say, you know, like at this point I'm a, at a place like, so when I'm in AA, I say I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. Cause I recognize that like that, you know, being an alcoholic, was what got me into the rooms of AA. And then once I did that, it kind of started the process of me like liking myself and healing in general, like pre dealing with like the trauma stuff, you know? So, so there's a level of gratitude for like the struggles that we go through. And so there is, there is a little bit of that is that, no, I would have not liked to have gone through any of this even a little bit, but I did go through it. And now that I'm in this position, I, there is a lot of ways where dissociation is incredibly helpful to me. And once you have some control over it, like has created things in my life that to other people are very mind blowing that to me are like not that big of a deal, you know, because there's a level like on certain parts, there's a level of confidence or something that like, you know, to try new things essentially, you know, or different stuff. So, you know, like right now, if I was talking about the weapon stuff, like seeing as like I might you know at some point like face some bodily harm or something like then yeah like I I am you know like fuck my abuser you know fuck Schmeagle you know and fuck all of them but you know now that I'm healing from stuff like am I going to be grateful that I know how to use a knife yes <laughs> you know I'm going to be incredibly grateful about that you know because like it was like the quote you you gave you know that it's like if I need to defend myself or my family I feel a lot more confident to be able to do that now. And I like that. I like feeling, I like feeling comfortable in my body and able to like, you know, handle myself in a situation versus feeling like afraid, you know? So, so that, that is, that is one way, you know, that it's, that those kind of things are beneficial or just like I said, like with the confidence, for example, you know, like the handler part of me that I ended up, you know, working with very early on, that was a persecutor part, you know, has, uh, had this way of treating me, you know, when it came to all my achievements, like my dad, essentially. So would like, I felt like I wasn't, um, I wasn't okay with myself unless I was achieving something, unless I was doing something like that was, you know, that, that like, you know, I could look at a painting, like uh, whatever, you know, like, you know, that like would make me feel like, okay, like I have some self-worth, <laughs> you know, but then also that's how, how I learned to deal with my abusers was to go above and beyond, you know, that it's like, you know, cause I learned that if I showed a certain skill, if you showed any less of that skill, you were going to get in trouble. So the best thing you could do is just to continually improve. And then it's like, it's like, you could stay ahead of the game, essentially just always be praised and never have to deal with the abuse side of things, you know? So like, for example, when I got started in my muraling, even for myself, that was a total mind fuck to feel like I was like this level of confidence that I was going to be able to get on a boom lift, you know, and fucking paint a 40 foot tall water tower, <laughs> you know? But like on a certain level, you know, or um, even like this, you know, being able to talk on a podcast, you know, it's because I have the, I have a part that's very okay, you know, with, with being, uh, what's the word, you know, the public part, like I talked about is very okay with being in front of people with doing what we call the tap dance, like quote unquote, like where it's just like, like, Hey, look how precocious and interesting I am, you know, and like, you know, like, and just kind of like, you know, being just kind of like 
bubbly and just, you know, just whatever and feeling like confident to just like address you and thousands of other people, you know, like, like if I, like if it was just like the main me and I did have not, didn't have that access to that part as well at all, you know, which I didn't when I was pregnant. So the one interview I did while I was pregnant was incredibly difficult because it's like, it felt, I had all the anxiety. I had all that, like, it was just, it was, it was difficult, <laughs> you know, most of the time I can be an AA, I can be like this, you know, and I can talk and not have a lot of fear. And I, and I get that from, from that, that confidence from that part, you know, and the, uh, um, you know, the other one with the boom lift, like I said, it's like, cause he treated me like my dad. He was pretty much like, you can do anything, you know, <laughs> like, and it was just like, like, yeah, you fucking figure it out type of thing. So I went through the whole process with the city and the other artists, you know, to give them the design and do all this stuff and then show up on the day of at the work site. And I'm just like, holy shit, I have this giant piece of ma machinery, this like crazy stuff that I have to like drive around and not damage. Cause it's fucking like millions of dollars. I'm sure it's all like city water equipment and stuff to get to this like thing. And then I'm going to be 40 feet up in the air, <laughs> like painting, painting this like mural, you know? And it was like, you know, for a lot of people like that was just, you know, uh, or doing live painting like I've done on stage at tattoo conventions. For a lot of people, that's like completely mind blowing, you know. And for me, because it's like there's a part that feels like that's their job. That's what they were meant for, you know, like even the part that was confident was just like, yeah, we'll figure it out and had no issue, you know, just figuring it out, like with the boom lift. And then the part, you know, that was painting could switch in like once we were actually up there, you know, <laughs> like, and, but it, it was, it takes a lot of teamwork and everything, you know, between the parts. So like I mentioned the metaphor in the first one, when it comes to dissociation, when it comes to good thing, good things about programming, it only comes from like, from, from your own healing and your own integration. I, I really think, you know, because you get to the point where it's like, it, it's like a symphony and you have all the instruments playing at different times, you know, and it's like total chaos is what your life feels like. And then as you get some system understanding and you deal with your trauma therapy and everything, and you increase internal communication, what you'll experience is, you know, all of those parts of yourself, you know, playing when like, like instruments playing when they're supposed to, and it'll create like a beautiful symphony and you'll have a part come in here, you know, and then another one come in here. And like by all of them working together, you know, they're all completely different instruments that sounds shitty if they're playing, you know, randomly, but if everything works together, it creates something really beautiful. And that's, that's always the goal for me in my life. I'm never, I'm, my goal is not integration and being like, you know, like, oh, there's like one person you know one personality in here because ultimately like with my understanding of DID I was never given the chance to have one person one personality it's like the abuse started so early so it's more about about reconnecting with all those pieces that you lost and just creating you know the version of yourself that you know all of you can be happy with that was a great explanation of that thank you I love that people are so like they're asking such sophisticated questions you know I know is, that's why I was like wow people are great questions holy crap <laughs> I love it let me see if there was anything else that I had sent about healing specifically um some of it you had already covered that people had asked um and one hopefully of, my channel too is primarily going to be focused on on that like just kind of breaking down different healing tips because it's a very overwhelming process so I feel like having like little concrete exercises to do when it comes to journaling or stuff like that goes a long way to like kind of like you know like trying to think of what to do when you're in trauma brain is like ah you know so it helps to just uh, be like all right do this right now and see if it helps you know yes and then hearing it from somebody that's like so level-headed like you you know and hearing it like from a clinical perspective that's not like so emotional emotionally charged like how it probably feels is very relieving too. You know, it's like working out a math problem almost. Like you can yeah. be a bit more logical about it instead of getting so stuck in, you know, what you're feeling. You can say, okay, well, what are the steps that I can take? What are my tools? How do I navigate this? You know, and then to just have that realization that the more work you put into it, it does go from being this beginning orchestration of people brand new to playing an instrument, you know, and they all sound kind of quirky and don't know how to work together. But the more you practice, like you said, you have this beautiful symphony at the end and it's worth all that work that you put into it. So that's also inspiring to see like what's on the other side of, of putting that work in, you know, cause I'm sure it's so yeah. daunting to even think about how the hell do I, 
how do I make all this work? You know, and, and yeah. you're such a living testament to that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And then I wanted to ask too, this was, this is a subject change, not on healing, but somebody, this is actually a good question. Um, you know, we, we've heard multiple times, like where they get children for sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And somebody had asked about animals, um, saying that not knowing where they get animals for sacrifices has casted a doubt on their own memories. So I don't know that or if you, or if you could speak on it, but that would be maybe a good question to answer too, since animals don't get talked about enough, but they're in a lot of these scenarios. Yeah. I mean, one thing I would say to someone, if they're doubting their memories because of something logistical like that, I wouldn't (laughs) basically, you know, too much, you know, just because like you're, you know, especially if you're dealing with memories, like until you're, you're pretty far along in healing and, and have, most of your gaps filled in, there are going to be a lot of things that are going to like not make a lot of sense that will make sense later, you know? So like, so, you know, when I was first dealing with all the incest and trafficking memories, having memories in the kennel for me was just like, it felt like too crazy to be real, you know? Like I was just like, like really that's something that they would like, they would treat me like a dog and drug me up and do bestiality and put me in a cage. You know, it sounds, it sounds so insanely foreign, you know, to like, to, you know, your experience even as like a front person when, cause you've been so dissociated from your memories and, and, and clinical, I'll say real quick, I'm good at doing the clinical thing. My life and my, my therapists have called it like engineer brain. I just am like, I like, breaking things down into into its parts but the thing is is like I was incredibly dissociated from my emotions like I did not understand them what the feeling of anger how to recognize it you know like like sadness you know I was all of it you know was insanely dissociated for me until I started my trauma therapy like seven years ago so for me my entry into healing has essentially been through having to learn how to break emotions down, you know, like into like a more like physical, biological understanding of things, you know, so that, you know, because if you're a survivor, you're going to have trouble understanding emotions or dealing with emotions, you know, so that's, that's also why I try and stick in that in that area. Sorry to go off on a tangent, you know, real quick. But so one thing I would say, you know, with the with the memories, you know, of like being like, you know, they've sacrificed a bunch of animals, you know, where could, where could they get them from? Or like, maybe they're a weird kind of animal or something like that. Like that, I feel like I, I wouldn't obsess over little things like that in my healing. I, I, because the answer will probably be filled in at some point in the future, you should just deal with the things that are creating the emotional upset, you know, and if in those memories that you're dealing with, it's about animals, you know, regardless of what animals or whatever else, like you just have to, like, that's what I was saying, no judgment. You just have to listen to that part and what they're sharing, even if you don't understand it or have context for it, because you probably will understand it, have context later. So what I would say is you'll probably end up getting context for like where these animals came from. For me personally, it was because of the kennel memory. Like it was essentially like, um, kind of like a more long-term boarding facility slash vet's office in a more rural area of Texas, you know? So they um, had a lot of land, you know, they had like, they had a lot of different, a lot of different animals, you know, and they essentially would, you know, would, it, it wasn't weird for there to, for them to be there essentially, you know? So, and the thing is, is like, you're going to have like, um, so some of the animals are just going to come from litters there, you know, for me, like, so for kittens or, you know, things like that, you know, but you're like, if you're dealing with like more like weird things, you know, or farm things or different stuff, like you have to understand if you're dealing with psychopaths, like they network and they're in every sector of society, you know, so like, they're not, it's, you know, in my experience, you'll have, a, you know, dentists, doctors, military, you know, um, police officers, you know, and the thing they're they're common, you know, like their title doesn't really matter. The common thing that they like, you know, the reason they network with each other is because they share victims, you know, so and because they have the same interest in, in, you know, harming people or animals or something, you know, so really, like, like, if, like, I, I wouldn't know, like, with someone's particular circumstance, you know, but like, if someone has a fetish for killing a specific animal, 
they're going to find a connection to get access to it. It's not going to be, it's not more difficult than getting access to a kid, you know, <laughs> we're talking about an animal, you know? So, so really, you know, like, like realistically, like you're there, if there's like a specific fetish of someone for certain animals or different things, you know, or whatever, like they're going to find a way, they're going to find a way to access it, you know, like they're going to, it's going to, you know, or it's going to be a convenience thing too. Maybe they just have like a friend who has like extra X, Y, Z on hand. And that becomes their, you know, that's like their new victim, you know, who knows, you know, but that's the thing I would just say is that it, the animals, you know, if, if they can get people, <laughs> if they can get p kids for this kind of thing, you know, like, like getting the animals is, is really not going to be, is not going to be difficult. You know, there's, there's, in my experience, pedophiles are never isolated. You know, they're always networking. They're always, you know, like essentially, you know, looking for others like them so that they can, you know, expand their, you know, their access to other victims and stuff. So, I mean, you know, and they just enjoy, you know, being able to talk about the shit they like with someone else. So, um, so yeah, yeah like animals, yeah, like people, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff for sure. Yes. And you think about like, you know, with humans, there's the, the channels of obviously you could just straight up kidnap somebody, but realistically there's breeding programs, there's CPS, like there's, there's lots of ways that For Mexico and my, like a lot of mine was my experience, you know, was that like it, you were going to be dealing with like, maybe like, like a lot of my experience was, um, you know, was like Mexican kids basically. Cause it was in Texas. I was in, in, um, Arizona and everything. So you're going to have people that are, you know, coyotes you know they're trafficking people across the border like that you know like that you know you're gonna have like an, an easy supply you know of, of stuff um so and and in the, my experience you know those like I would say you know like one of them was probably like a baby farm in my experience you know or maybe just like a neglected kid you know that had gotten sold you know by by a parent but you know the the kids that for the hunting memory that I had talked about like they they were all like, and I think this was intentional, you know, they were all like very, uh, very like, like they had just been kidnapped, you know, so they were kids that hadn't been traumatized that were in, you know, pajamas or different stuff like that. But I think a lot of that was, was intentional because it's like, you know, like, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, you kind of don't want kids that are going to dissociate, you know, it's like you want kids that are going to act like afraid and like put up a fight and stuff like that, you know, so there's, di there's different uses of, you know, really victims, like, like you're saying, it's like animals, people, it's like, it's the, it's not just like the incident they put you through, you know, for the programming, it's also the, who they decide, you know, needs to fit the bill for the victim, you know, as well. Absolutely. And so many of those ways can transfer over to pets, you know, like there's breeders of animals. So if somebody had, you know, an, an affinity or a fetish for say, you know, Rawweilers, for example, like, you could go to a breeder or you could ask a dog yeah. to call you whenever that, that dog gets turned in, you know, like exactly. there's definitely so many ways that people can have access. To things. So thank you for that. That was an interesting question. So I appreciate you answering that. Of Is course. That, that you wanted to cover tonight or anything else that you had on your list to cover? Um, I think we got through most of the questions and you had answered some of them already. Yeah, I know I answered a decent amount of them just just by our chatting and everything. I I really think, I mean, for me, um, I, I feel like this is a great a great time to stop. You know, the only thing that like I hadn't really touched on, you know, that someone had mentioned was like was maybe, you know, like going into a little bit more detail on a couple of like of the more occult style rituals, you know, and you know that is something I'm willing to do. Like if you ever want to have me on in the future, just sure. because, it, um, you know, with everything else we, we had talked about today, it did feel like it was going to be like a whole nother, like <laughs> whole nother box to open up, you know? So, um, you know, and I'm, I'm long winded, you know, <laughs> so I'm sure this is going to be another long one. So thank you, you know, again, for just, you know, giving me the platform to share and to just be really, you know, open about my experience and to feel like I can do something for the victims that like, that haven't been able to have a say and everything. And, and I just hope that, you know, that this will continue to like, contribute to your podcast and like and you know our common goal of creating awareness around around like child trafficking and ritual abuse you know and snuff pornography and all the horrible things that still go on in this world that need to not anymore so 
Thank you, Emma. Well, thank it's, been, you. it's been very healing. Oh my gosh. This is some of the hardest stuff to talk about. And I, it takes it. I want people to understand like how much it took for you to get up and share all of that. You know, like I feel, I still feel like I could cry. I'm sure you feel very emotional too. Like this is it's really heavy stuff that we're talking about here and it's, it's real. So I'm so grateful that you're bringing attention to this. Cause not that like, you know, going into detail is always necessary to understand that there's bad things, but I think it just hits people differently to like be able to have the empathy of like how you provided with like seeing a photo and imagining like what that child went through, you know? And I think when people, can start to regain back their empathy, you know, that's when we start to make strides to like, we're so disconnected from that as a society. And like, these stories always bring me back to that in my core, you know, and keep me connected to that. And out of the, you know, the fear propaganda that so I see so many other people in, you know, like I'd rather be in the space of like this love and healing energy as hard as it is to experience. I'd rather be on this side than like hating people yeah. and in this fear mindset, you know? So I appreciate the healing element that you bring to these conversations and for your vulnerability and for your courage to share some of the hardest things that, you know, to listen to, to experience, to even comprehend. I appreciate you coming on here and sharing with people because I know the last time, I mean, so many people got incredible value out of it. And I think they're going to be just as touched this time, you know, so thank you, Carrie, for coming on. It means the world to me. Well, thank you again, Emma, for having, having your podcast and it's been great healing for me, you know, and now it just feels like it, it is a whole nother level, you know, so, so thank you. I, you're, you're doing God's work and I, I really appreciate, appreciate all the work that you put in. I hope people understand how much work you really do, you know, on your own time, just to kind of like, to help us all out. Yeah, I appreciate you, Carrie. You make it easy. And where can people find you? You just started a YouTube channel. So I want you to give the name of that so people can go follow you. And then your Instagram also, and I'll link those in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so my Instagram, um, and it's a, it's like a professional page. So if you want to get through to me on there, it would actually be best if you, uh, shoot me an email, which is, which is on there. Um, but the Instagram is cover up underscore Carrie, C-A-R-R-I-E, um, because I am a, uh, I specialize in cover up tattoos. Um, and then, uh, the, title of the uh, YouTube videos, which I haven't put on yet, is Desert Dakini, but you can just search. Um, I don't know what the at is, I think. <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind just linking it, you know, I'm, I'm not great with all the internet stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm so excited. You had talked about doing it last time and then you did it right after. So now you guys yeah. can still carry on YouTube and she's going to start her own channel, putting out content, which is really exciting. Um, and I can't wait to see what you create with that. So you guys go follow Carrie. I'm going to link all of her stuff below. Please share this however you can, whether it's just to one person, whether it's posting it to a channel, sharing it with a friend. Um, we need to get the word out on this, you know, and we need, we need people to, to get the awareness and we need people to care. We need people to take action. We need more people to speak up. We need more resources. Like there's so many reasons why we need to get these stories out, you know, and, and, I always say these platforms are not going to propagate or boost these up in the algorithm. Like we really need your help. Like you guys are the boots on the ground helping get this information out. We're here telling you, but you guys are the help. You guys are the ones that take the envelope and, you know, deliver the mail to other people. So please help us oh, yeah. in doing this and share Carrie's story far and wide. And thank you guys so much for listening and for tuning in and for just holding space for these really hard conversations and for sitting it, sitting through it with us. Like, I know this was a really emotional episode and I appreciate the people that are still here right now listening to us talk. So thank you guys for caring enough to to listen to Carrie's story and to just hang in here with us and, and understand these really hard things that are very real. So you guys go connect with us. I have all of my information also in the show notes. So follow us on social media, share, 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 comment, boost her up, go follow Carrie, go hype her, go tell her how loved she is and amazing. And as always, you guys, God bless you and we will see you next week.